Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you're having a fantastic week, even though it's only uh, Monday. <laughs> but uh, but hey, if you're not and it's off to a rough start, it's about to get better because I have a phenomenal interview lined up for you guys. Rob has been a long time coming on this show and we finally got it done. And I think you guys are really gonna enjoy it. We talk about his entire career and we get into some philosophical type stuff that I think you all are gonna find extremely interesting as well. And I wanna tell you all about the Vigilance Elite newsletter that we're kicking off. All kinds of good stuff coming through that, especially the exclusive content that's only for newsletter people. And uh, all kinds of other stuff, when the gummy bears are gonna release, new products, all that stuff. It's all coming out on the newsletter. It's our only way to get directly to you without any algorithms in the way. So anyways, it's free, sign up, links in the description. And on another note, I just wanna personally thank all of you for being here. I love you all, thank you, and enjoy the show. guys are here because this is not a drill. Uh, this is real. We found a thing and this thing is in a house. And this house is in a bowl and this bowl is in a country. <clears throat> and you guys are gonna, you're gonna go get this thing and you're gonna bring it back to us and show it to us. Good evening. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. I said, you guys realize this is a one-way mission. We're not coming back from this one. We're targeting uh, Al-Qaeda in places where they've never seen guys like us. The reason you guys are here is this is as close as we've ever been to Osama bin Laden. Good evening, the Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden is dead, killed by American special forces who raided his hideout in Pakistan in the early hours of the morning. And I remember putting my, my first foot came out and I'm looking at bin Laden's house and I remember thinking, fuck it, I guess we'll start the war from here. These remarkable pictures from right inside his compound show us exactly where Osama bin Laden was finally killed. The woman that found bin Laden said, I don't know what it looks like inside, but there will be a stairwell going to the second floor and you will run into Khalid bin Laden. And he's 20 years old, that's bin Laden's son, and that is his last line of defense. He will be armed on the stairwell. The blood you can see on the floor, evidence of how he was shot in the head through his left eye. Simply because he went this way, I turned this way. And standing three feet in front of me is Osama bin Laden, and he's got his hands on a maul, his wife's shoulders. And I turn around and um, I, I kind of froze. And I'm, okay, we get, we, other Navy SEALs are now coming in the room. A lot of guys are in there, and one of my guys came up to me, and uh, he said, um, are you good? And I said, no, no, uh, what are we supposed to do now?
Rob O'Neill, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's great. It's been a long time coming. It has, yeah. I think we've been promising to do this for a while. Yeah, I shit. Just never, never got around to it. I even, I even lived near here for a couple of years, and I don't know how I didn't make it here. Yeah, well, it's life gets in the way, right? Yeah, it does. Life but, happens around you. But uh, well, we had a great conversation about the upcoming alien invasion that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm at a point right now where nothing would surprise me. Right. No, and I, and even if aliens showed up, I would question: Are those really aliens, or is just the government just the final push? That's what I'm saying. And I don't know what to believe. I mean, I've seen enough stuff to. Be, I believe a lot of things now, and, and there's other stuff that I I'm not sure if I believe it. So it's just a, it's a crazy world. It's to the point where no matter what happens, I'm not going to be surprised. No, I mean consider a few years ago that a lockdown was just something you see in a movie. There's no way this would really happen, and it did. And yeah. we fell for it. Yeah, hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm. All of us. Even if you're, you know, the anti-masker, you still stay in your house. It's not like you're, you're not going to fly without it. Yeah, you're not, you're, you're not traveling without it. So. Yeah. Well, actually, I got everybody. I get everybody a gift, and I uh, was going to get you a Delta Sky Miles. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, can I open it now? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> what do we got here? These are gummy bears. Those are gummy bears. <laughs> well, thank you. They go good with uh, your beer company. That's great. With your beer. That's right. Oh, you're awesome. I need to get some of that beer to I'll put get, on yeah, my I'll bar. I'll, get, I'll definitely get you some. Not a problem at all. But, Armed uh, Forces Brewing Company. We'll send you out as soon as we get done with this. Yeah, I'll put it right there on the bar. Cool. Very cool. You know, we'll drink it during the show. Yeah, we have we have a beer uh, for every branch. We have Jarhead, um, Soldier Beer, Cat Shot for Pilots, Special Hops, which I thought was pretty Special cool. Special Hops. Special Hops is an IPA. <laughs> It's really good. We just came out with uh, Neptune's beer it, uh, to sort of com commemorate Neptune's spear, which is commonly mispronounced. It's Neptune's spear, as in King Neptune's spear. Interesting. People say Neptune's spear, but that's, you know, it's the two S's in a row. Yeah. What, you got any, what's your favorite flavor? IPA. IPA? Special hops, yeah. This is my favorite. Special hops. But but the, the um, when, when Neptune's beer is available, it's going to be, I think, 12%. So that might be my new favorite. Nice. Yeah. Nice. You gonna get into hard stuff at all, or stick? Uh, not just yet, but if it if the opportunity arises, um, probably. Well, I'm sure that's gonna come. But, well, hey, I just want to start. Let's. You got a hell of a career. Let's go through the your entire career. You know, hit the high points. Obviously, the Bin Laden raid. But I want to start with you know where you grew up, Montana. What was your childhood like? Well, it was uh, kind of living in a bubble. That you you know, there's nothing on the other side of that mountain. Butte, Montana. Butte, Montana is the center of the universe, and people from anywhere else are probably going to be better than you. Kind of a weird situation, a fear of, of success, I guess. Um, so I you know I grew up hunting. That was a normal thing. It was normal to hunt elk. It was normal to go uh, mule deer, whitetail hunting, fishing, and I played a lot of basketball. Um, that was that was going to be my plan. I was going to get so good at basketball that I would get college paid for, and then I was going to stay in Butte, Montana, and be a stockbroker or something like that. You know, get an MBA maybe from Montana Tech, where I did go for a year. Nice. Were you pretty tired with your old man? Yeah, yeah. We we kind of did everything together. We started hunting basically the same reason I joined the Navy because he got dumped. He got a second divorce, and we just had to do something, so we started hunting. We I think the first time we went hunting, it was in a. It was in a, a two-door Datsun car, my Uncle Jack's, and we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to sight in a weapon. Um, kind of went out. We got we got a doe tag for an antelope, <laughs> and we went out. All we knew how to do was get uh, the the cooler stocked. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, like sodas and Twinkies and sandwiches and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We used to call it the buffet, and that was kind of it. It was uh, there was basketball season, there was hunting season, there was fishing, and then. Um, Hanging out in Butte, Montana, which I thought was a big city at the time because I didn't, you know, we didn't really go anywhere. Do you miss it there? Uh, I do. I love to go back. I, I, I sometimes get jealous of people that have a normal job and a normal life. Nine to five, you know, wake up in the morning, kiss your kids, go to work, have lunch, come home, be with your kids. I totally understand that. Yeah. Just I, a, no, a normal life. I mean, I, yeah, it's kind of cool. I don't have really shit to worry about. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. What, so what did your old man do? He was a stockbroker. He's oh, he was a stockbroker. Yeah. Now he does weird shit. Like he bought a, a really fast Harley, and he's seventy three, and uh, I think it scares him. <laughs> but uh, he bought it, and he's uh, actually taking his uh, road 
test soon due to the, the cone thing. Oh, shit. He's, yeah. like, brand new on a bike. Yeah. Well, he, he had one before. He had a Honda Shadow, I remember, growing up, but I don't think he ever rode it. I think he just had it. Yeah. But he's good now. He's, he's still a fly fisherman. He just put a, a basketball court in, um, in his backyard. Oh, nice. He plays in the winter in Montana. He, he'll go out and shovel it and uh, shoot free throws. He's still really good. He's got a good shot. So... When did you? If that was the plan, what? How the hell did the SEAL teams and the Navy? Well, the, even the come SEAL up? teams was an accident, because um, it was it w- wasn't necessarily getting dumped by a girl, but it was a situation that, you know, I started. To, well, once I joined the Navy, I realized most people are similar. You get to an age where, I just got to get out of here, and that was where I was at. I bad relationship. Uh, basketball wasn't. I was playing, but it wasn't fun anymore, and it's, I need to go on an adventure, and I had two friends that always wanted to be Marines. Growing, I grew up with them. Jim McBride and Ben Walaszewski. And they all, I'm, I'm talking high and tights growing up, Marine Corps stickers on their first trucks. They're, you know, they, they were Marines. And then and then I would see them come, they were two years older than me. I would see them come back to Butte, Montana. And like, it was like watching someone from Full Metal Jacket walk into, the, I was in the Vu Villa and Ben walked in. I'm like, holy shit. I mean, that's a Marine. Like that guy, can, I, I still wasn't going to join. I was still playing basketball. And I was like, that's a fucking Marine, though. This, I like that. I'm going to watch this guy kick someone's ass in here. This is going to be great because no one can touch, can touch him. And then when it was time to leave, um, like, because as a young man, you you can go out and see the world for free by joining the military. Yeah. And I, I again, full metal jacket. I, I, like everyone else, I watched that a thousand times. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do that because I guarantee. Um, Boot camp is going to suck, but I want to meet that drill instructor. You know, how, yeah. just how funny he is, but brutal. And I want to be tough like a Marine. So I went to join the Marine Corps. Just went down there and there was a... My wife calls me the luckiest unlucky man in the world. <laughs> she, I think one of her saying, like through life, I think one of her sayings is, you could trip over your dick, but you're going to land in a pot of gold. <laughs> right? So uh, I, went, I went in to join the Marine Corps. And as luck would have it, the Marine wasn't there. He was literally out to lunch. And the Navy guy was, the Navy guy was. Oh, shit. And, and I went over to him because my two friends, and I'm, I'm, everyone's heard this joke before, but my two friends, Ben and Jim, said, the Marine Corps is actually part of the Department of the Navy. It's just the men's department. <laughs> and that's why I went in there, because if they're part of the department, he'll know where he is. And then he'll, you know, and I, I said, um, hey, where's the, Mar- where's the Marine? When's he going to be back? And, you know, so he's sitting there. He's a Navy chief, khakis, anchors. I didn't know what the shit that meant, but he's a chief, so he's clever. And he said, why do, you, why do you want the Marine? I said, I want to be a sniper. And Mar- I grew up hunting. Marines have the best snipers in the world. I read Carlos Hathcock's book. Like, I want to do that. And he goes, look no further, my friend. We have snipers in the Navy. All you have to do is become a Navy SEAL first. No big deal. We'll send you right to sniper school. <laughs> and I didn't know what that was, right? I'm from Montana, and I didn't know how to swim. Oh, and me shit. being a, a naive young man, I, I thought, you know, um, I don't know what a SEAL is, but this guy here is a professional recruiter. Why would he lie to me? <laughs> And I signed it, and um, I signed the contract to go. The only thing I did right um, was I, I learned early in life to get it in writing. Whatever you're doing, fine, we can do business on a handshake, but sign this first. Yeah. Get it. So I got in writing. It was called the Dive Fairer Program. The Dive Fairer? The Dive Fairer Program, which meant um, you get like a $2,500 bonus. You are guaranteed a chance to go to Bud's. Basically, underwater demolition seal training. You're guaranteed a chance, and I didn't. I mean, I didn't know that all that meant is you can go and fail, and then you're going to the fleet. Yeah. And so I signed that, and um, yeah, that was it. And then, and then he started showing me videos of buds. I didn't know what that was. I the only thing I knew about um, Navy SEALs was um, watching Charlie Sheen's character jump off the bridge in the movie Navy SEALs. Eddie Braun is his name. He's he's still it's his stunt man, which is awesome. Uh, very good guy. Very good stunt man. I guess during that scene, too, I'm kind of jumping around. Eddie Braun said, all right, I'm going to do this. You get one take. And he, the, the famous uh, jumping off the yeah. scene. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, that's what I thought it was. And then I knew something about um, sit-ups with 2,000-pound logs. Mm-hmm. My buddies that I grew up with that I thought knew a lot about um, the military said, there's no fucking way in hell you're going to make it through SEAL. What did you just do? I took my mom to the recruiting station to have her watch videos. And she didn't tell me to my face, but she's like... There's no fucking way you can make it through this train. <laughs> and uh, the only person that says that I think really believed in me was my father. Um, just because I, um, 
because of our attitudes with uh, free throws and ma master the basics. Um, free throws, that's, if I could describe life, it would be how to be successful in life, free throws. Because it's master the basics. Do your thing, shoot here, muscle memory. You want to be great, do it a thousand times. You want to be really great, do it 10,000 times. Do everything like you do anything. We would, we would do drills, my father and me. Um, we would play every single day. And um, anything from an hour of one-on-one -on -one to three hours of five-on-five. -five. But we were not allowed to leave the gym until one of us made at least 20 free throws in a row. So that start with a make, and then you keep shooting. And um, that's something else, too, about uh, like stances with shooting and all that stuff. When you make your first free throw, you don't move. You're in the position. I hate watching basketball players now. They make a free throw, and they got to go give everyone five. Fuck you. It's your job. You made yeah. a free throw. Make the second one, and then talk about how awesome you are. But we couldn't leave the gym until one of us made 20 in a row. And that could take five minutes. That could take three hours. Yeah, but we uh, we got we got so good at it that we made ourselves. There's a there's a um, a steakhouse in Butte, Montana called the Derby, and like Montanans, like, like I said, how we don't know how good it is because we're just there, don't realize how great the steaks are at the Derby in Butte, Montana. Um, we would start our season off twenty in a row to leave the gym, twenty for a steak. Now it stays at 20 to leave the gym, but now it goes up by five. 25 for a steak, 30 for a steak, 35 for a steak, 20 to leave the gym, 50 for a steak. And we get to the point, uh, my father made 91 in a row, and that was the family record for a week, because the next week I made 105 in a row. In a row? In a row. And you know what's funny is like a lot, well, a lot of things in life, only two of us saw it, so you can take my word for it or tell me yeah. all this shit. But um, yeah, so um, um, I, he believed in me. And um, so being lucky instead of good, um, I had my student ID to Montana Tech. They had a pool. So that meant I could still get into the pool like at five in the morning. And I went up there and I'm like, okay, the breaststroke is one of the strokes. It can't be that hard. It's 25 meters down, 25 meters back. I'll swim a thousand meters and gauge it yeah. from there. And like anything... With like everything was going fine until I entered the water, and that's when the problem started. <laughs> I made it to the deep end. I almost didn't make it back, and I was like, "I'm fucked." I just signed a contract with the government to be a Navy SEAL, and I don't know how to swim. Holy! So shit. I, I was trying, to, and I'm I'm busting my ass doing whatever. And uh, my friend, I, so I, I I'm in there for and just dying. I'm trying to get out, and my friend, Mike Driscoll, I went to high school with him, one of the few people in Montana who did swim, and I believe he did go on to swim at Notre Dame. And he said, Rob, don't take this the wrong way. It's great to see you. I've just literally never seen you in the pool before. <laughs> what gives? And I said, I just, I just joined the Navy. I'm going to be a SEAL. And he goes, oh, no, not like that. You're not. And he goes, come here. <laughs> and then he showed me, um, he showed me the, how to do the breaststroke, how to do the side stroke. And so with repetition, I just... Um, I would go there every day. And I, I still have my, um, there's a little packet you get when you join the Navy, that folder. And even like there's the Bud's warning order and all that yeah. shit. I still have that with my, I would write my times down for the 500 yard swim that you had to do. No shit. Mm -hmm. You still have that? I still have it. I found it in a, one of the kit bags that we all keep because I might need this sleeping bag someday. Yeah. <laughs> um, but and then I was, I was up there, I was getting pretty decent. And then Jim McBride... The Marine, who's actually, he, he was enlisted. He actually, I think he just retired as a lieutenant colonel, which is awesome. Semper Fi, that's what he was going to do. He was going to be a Marine. He, he went to air crew um, school in, in the Marine Corps, and they taught him how to really do the combat recovery stroke. And he goes, just do this a couple times. And, I, and just like when I saw Ben in the Vu Villa, I was watching Jim swim. And I'm like, okay, I, this is next level shit. Now I got to get this. And so I just, you know, I, I got proficient, I thought. Yeah, and then I I did get to to boot camp, and you know I, I actually failed the the screening test the first time, because I, I took it like an asshole um, after you get those ninety shots and you're just sick as a dog, cotton mouth whatever, um, and I was I remember sitting there there how many people try out in in, in boot camp for, at the time there must have been four hundred people. What year is this? Nineteen ninety six. Ninety six. And uh, looking at this bleachers and I still had that. Small town mentality. I remember looking at the Navy SEAL flag, the unofficial Navy SEAL flag. I'm watching this arrogant team guy. I didn't know what to think of Navy SEAL. He came out there and like did this perfect dive that like Greg Luganis would have loved for a number of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then he got out and kind of just gave us the, the stink eye. And and, he, and I remember looking, thinking, 
there's no fucking way. Why? Look at all these guys trying out. And, and then, uh, but then I started talking to other guys that were from Brooklyn. Uh, some, some dudes that, that joined the Navy to get out of Compton. Guys from South Florida. And I started to realize that, okay, everyone's scared. Everyone's kind of the same. We're all the same. And, and, then, and then it started sinking. I mean, later on in life, I realized that I don't give a shit if you're the CEO of a major company. You're the guy in Bin Laden's bedroom. We've all had our first day. Yeah. And we've all been scared. Admitted, I mean, we'll talk about the one percenters later, which exist, um, that aren't scared. It will pass. They, they, but the rest of us get scared. Um, the rest of us have been nervous. But if you can just take it at increments at a time. And so the next time I got there, I, I, I lost the intimidation. I gave up the bullshit with, I just got shots. No, fuck that. Do the swim, do the pull-ups, do the sit-ups, do the push up do the damn run, and get on with your life. And, and that was it. I mean, and uh, you know, just being in boot camp. And I, I kind of, I'm a big believer in um, wherever you are, be there. So I, I got into um, the classes we were taking. Okay, I'm going to be a Navy SEAL, but I want to learn about naval customs and courtesies, tradition. I want to learn what the horn blew. Like, I paid attention. I was interested in this. The, the, whatever they, I, I was interested in how to make a bed, how to fold your, your shirts. I still do it. And, um, I got into it and then I, I did, you know, I got the contract in there with the, you know, now you're with a Navy SEAL chief and you, 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 you know, you're going to get your orders. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, part of the dive fair program, I didn't realize this was you have to be a corpsman. Okay. I didn't see that in the fine print, but I, I finagled my way. When you go up to get your rates, I made up some bullshit. And uh, I, I found out what the shortest A school was so I could get to Bud's right away. And it was a air crew survival equipment man or a parachute rigger. So <clears throat> I would get that. I knew I would, would finish boot camp, go to Millington, Tennessee. It, it was like a two or three week A school. And I, I was with Marines now, but... I mean, I'm talking huge, dude. I had there's one huge Marine, one white dude, one black dude. Huge Marines. I'm still intimidated by Marines. And then this big black Marine, this I'll never forget, he's a staff sergeant. He taught me how to wind a bobbin and how to sew. And at first I thought, okay, I'm into some shit, but I don't know. And then I'm like, wait a minute, sewing might be an awesome trait. I'm going to pay attention. This is a big, tough Marine taught me how to sew. I learned about cyclic rate of fire for a console machine. You know what was bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> and but that, and the teams that turns out to be a good thing. But before yeah. we had all the high speed kit that they, they, you need to cut this pocket off, sew it here. Where do you want your stuff? And the, but never tell anyone you're good at it because then your first LPO, he'll have you sewing everyone's uniforms. Yeah, you have a uh, a year workup to get all 100 of these <laughs> blouses or whatever. But yeah, I went to Millington and um, went back to Butte, Montana for um, leave, and then drove my truck to Coronado. And the first place I stopped in uh, in Coronado was uh, was right by the Hotel Dell. And uh, I just wanted to get in the ocean to, you know, if I was uh, talking to 19 year old Rob O'Neill now, I'm like, dude, you're going to get ocean time. Just stay out. Yeah. Don't take cold showers. You just, my thing about the cold showers when I, when um, I talk to young kids, young men that want to be seals and they'll say, um, what should I be doing to get ready for buds? And I'll say, well, let me answer your question with a question. What are you doing? to get ready for buds and they say uh, taking cold showers to get used to it and I'm like you know what stop that right now and I'm going to tell you I'm going to give you an example if I told you in 30 days I'm going to kick you in the nuts as hard as I can and in order to get ready for it you had your best friend kick you in the nuts every single day guess what it's still going to suck when I do it yep. don't prepare for shit it's just take it like a man every single yeah. time yeah so I, I got there and uh, um, I, it, it was a Thursday night and I was in the, I got into the, 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 um, the Pacific Ocean and all of a sudden there were these, these boats rowing by and there was chem lights on the side of them. And it took me a second to realize, oh shit, I'm checking into class 208, that's 207 and this is hell week. And I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Like, Damn. Boy, you talk about swimming, you just jumped in with both feet and yeah. it's about to be on. And then, um. Yeah, I, I got a hotel. I checked in on a Friday, which was stupid. Wait till Monday. <laughs> like, why do you want quarter deck watch when you can at least go have your last beer in peace? Yeah, and then uh, 208 started. Bud's class 208. Um, uh, you know, and it's typical uh, starts off with, at the time, I think we called it PTRR. Um, yeah, that's what they called it. They, they didn't have quite the pipeline they do now. They're doing a better now with actually getting guys ready with prep and nutrition. 
Yeah. You know, this is back in the day when you had a Navy SEAL as a skydive instructor and you eat shit. He doesn't tell you how to work your canopy. He laughs at you. They have so many guys signing up now, apparently. This is this is uh, from this family that I used to train when I did tactics and stuff. He, this kid went in. They have so many people signing up to be SEALs now that, or go to BUDS, I guess, yeah. that they have to, they can't even take them all. Really? Yeah, they're they're showing up, and they sent this guy out to the fleet for two years. But broke his contract. That's how many people are signing. Well, up. that's what tells you about a contract with the government. They can tell you go fuck yourself, but yeah. you can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've seen plenty of that lately. Mm, yeah, but um, <clears throat> so, so you're yeah, not but yeah, checking in though. It goes from watching a special on on a, a cable news special about some reporter that went to. Now you're at Buds. And, yeah, and and I don't know what the fuck. And they brought us into a classroom, and we were still in our whites, our, dre our dress whites with like the, I, didn't, I think, what do you have, one little service medal or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. And we check in, and this instructor came, this instructor came in, and he goes, hey, anybody want to quit? And he was fucking around, like a team guy joke. This dude goes, I do. <laughs> right off the and, bat? And I never thought he was joking. He's like, no, he, he, he just, he got orders to Buzz to get off the ship. No shit. And then he quit because he knew he'd get like three weeks on to do whatever the hell he wants. Yeah, yeah. And so then he quit. And then um, uh, we had a, a, an instructor named uh, Eshelman. And he's a legend, if anyone knows who he is. A legend. And he said, um, this is how I started. I started to realize that they're training you how to, how to be successful in life. He said, uh, all right, I know. I mean, and he, buzz instructors are not historically nice guys but this guy was like he would say stuff look guys i'm not here to intimidate i'm here to motivate he was our class proctor so that is the one that helps you through and he said i i um i know you've seen the movies and probably read the books regardless of what you've been told this course is not impossible okay people graduate look at me i am living proof so i will never ask you to do anything impossible but i will make you do something very hard followed by something very hard followed by something very hard day after day after day for eight straight months, and that sounds like a lot to get from now to eight months from now, but don't think about that because that is not how you achieve a long-term goal. You do it like this. You wake up in the morning on time, then you make your bed the right way, then you brush your teeth. You just started the day with three victories. That's three wins already. Make it to the 5 a.m. PT on time, and as I'm beating you, do not think about the pain you're going through. Concentrate on your next goal in life, which is breakfast. After breakfast, make it to lunch. After lunch, your next goal in life is dinner. And after dinner, do everything you need to do to get back into that perfectly made bed. And because you took the time in the morning to make your bed the right way, regardless of how bad today was, and it will be bad. Tomorrow's a clean slate. Tomorrow is a fresh start. And when you feel like quitting, which you will, do not quit right now. That's a motion. I want you to quit tomorrow. If you can keep quitting tomorrow, you can do anything in life. And that's what I, I, I mean, I thought I wasn't going to make, I had to get up 15 minutes early to put on sunscreen. Like, I thought that would be a reason. A sunburn would get me out of buds. Um, but, you know, little shit like that. But I, that it started to enforce in me, fuck that. I'm going to put sunscreen on. I'm going to fail a swim, but I'm not going to quit. And, and then you start seeing guys quit. And, and one thing, one problem too is, uh, I called it sympathetic quitting when, 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 Someone that you think is tougher than you because he's louder than you quits. Well, if he can't make it, I can't make it. And they, I'm sure you saw it too in Buds. Yeah. Someone, well, should they just follow him? Like, it's like, fuck him. Like, even in the movies, when you see someone go into the bell and the other students are like, no, no, it's like, fuck you, quit. I don't want you. <laughs> yeah, join him. I'm not quitting. Yeah. And then it just, you know, it turns into uh, Hell Week. Um, and, I, you know, all of a sudden it's breakout. Like, we're in the tent. I know it's coming. And breakout starts, which is organized chaos. They're, you know, get a muster, get your bow crew, and like, fuck, they're not going to. They got, they got instructors like that are retired in there to fuck with you. Yeah. Just to realize the chaos. And, and uh, there was a guy that, that, that quit right off the bat in, the, in, in Breakout. And I'm like, dude, this is the best part. Like, this is, this is done the movies. And then, um, and then again, it's just the, uh, I, I did have someone say, you're, you know, obviously your next goal is, is your next meal. Your long term goal right now is sunrise of Wednesday. And if, if you can live the sunrise, You'll probably be so doped up from lack of sleep that you can they'll just push you through. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's Friday. And then uh um we did you know the mud pits, the famous shit at the end, like the bacteria infested cesspool we were whatever. And uh, I remember we had Admiral Richards was gonna secure us, and a typical admiral, he was three hours late, so they have to beat us for an extra three. It's like can someone just 
secure just, the shit. And can I get a Gatorade to just piece? let us go? Yeah. Hey, I remember he said he's shaking everyone's hands and like he's like the first admiral I ever met. And he's like, "Congratulations, O'Neill. Thank you, Admiral." Because now wipe that shit off your face. I'm like, "Roger that." Yeah, and then all of a sudden hell week's over, and then um, and then you're in the walk week where they're actually letting you recover, and then I'll I'll never forget our first swim because now you're done with hell week, and obviously hell week I think is the reason that Navy SEALs in combat will walk three miles out of their way to avoid getting their boots wet. Yeah, you get tortured. And um, our first two-mile swim, they had us line up and face the ocean. The first time getting in the ocean after Hell Week. And they made us line up, and we're just staring at it. And the same instructor, Eshelman, he comes walking up and down. He's like, first time in the ocean since Hell Week, huh, gents? Kind of spooky, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) And then you do that. You do the Hydro Recon, and then, boom, you get your uh, blue helmet. You're in dive face. What did you find? Did you... Did you make it through all at once? Yeah. You were an original? Yeah. Oh, that's not very many of those. I know. It, and uh, and I, it didn't make sense to me because, I mean, pool comp, uh, they have you do the test on Friday twice, and if you fail, you have to do it Monday. And then if you fail that, you're done. And then a lot of and people don't realize a lot of dudes fail pool comp. And you can get kicked out for failing pool comp. Most guys get rolled you know, to make it again. But I failed twice on, um, on Friday, and then I, I remember just practicing... Uh, uh, untying knots, practice breath holds. How am I going to get through this? And 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 that started to started to enforce that failure is sometimes a, a learning lesson. It, you can learn. Don't yeah. be afraid of failure. Just don't quit. And then I I, I went through and um uh, I I I think I untied most of the knots. And uh, you know you come up at the end. I feel fine. And then this instructor's here, and I just hear O'Neill pass. I'm like. Fuck yeah. And he grabbed me and he goes, you untied three of my whammy knots, fucker. And then you get out in your new dive phase. And now, and that's where you learn that the Navy can make anything suck. Because yeah. diving, scuba diving, I don't know if you know this, is fun. Not in the fucking Navy. No. So, you know, you do a little bit of open circuit stuff. Then you do the cool uh, 100, 120 feet dive in the Pacific, which is neat. Then you get into a dragger and then just learning how to count kicks and then ship attack shit and... You know, dive medicine, uh, dive physics, and you know the classroom stuff. Where that now, this is where the meatheads who can run five miles they fail. Yeah. Because now you got to learn about Boyle's law. You got to learn about the bends. Learn about uh, uh, AGEs, arterial gas embolism, shit like that. And, and all of a sudden you're done with that. And now it's third phase. And at this point, no one had, no one had told me that San Clemente Island is by far the worst part. I I mean I thought Hell Week was bad. I thought Pool Comp was bad. The fucking island for me was the worst. No shit. 40 straight days of nothing but getting beat. And I'm convinced the instructors are, you know, hitting the sauce a little bit up there because they're reminding us that no one, you know, we're we're killing you on one of the nicest beaches in the world. Nobody can hear you scream out here. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, we, I mean, you know, it's, and their thing was um, wet and sandy every hour on the hour for 24 hours. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You, You need to run to the surf, get, and your swim buddy goes with you. Every hour on the hour. And I have pictures of shit. Like, I mean, you can be in your... There's no point in even going to bed. Just sleep on the floor and then they'll, they're watching. Or we think they're watching. Yeah. I mean, they might not be, but what if they are? You know. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I had a... I had a uh, my swim buddy kept... He just got uh, some sort of homesick or some sort of island fever and he kept fucking everything up. He, like, he, he forgot to put the buff, buffer in his gun in the spring. And... Um, <laughs> And the instructor said, did you do a function check on this? And he's like, yes, I did. And he's like, he pulls it back. There's no spring. So obviously the gun doesn't work. And he goes, all right, you two, wet and sandy every hour. On so I'm getting punished for this guy, for my swim buddy. And then uh, I'll never forget, I think SEAL Team 3 was out there. So the BUDS compound is here. And then the kick-ass uh, SEAL compound like for Navy SEALs. And they're still legends to us. Um, they, they fucked up a, a demo shot in the bay there. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't double double fucking whatever. It didn't go off. It didn't go off. So now you got all these charges in the water that don't go off. And there's like this. I, I'm I'm going to screw up the regulations for the Navy, but I think it's uh, 48 hours. No one can even get in. The EOD can't even go in there because it might go. And and any everyone knows that an explosion in the water is way worse than an explosion on land because water doesn't compress. So um, my buddy fucked up again, and they're like, "Okay, you, God." And the instructor goes. Well, I can't get you guys wet every hour on the... I can't put you in the surf every hour on the hour because I have demo shots. And I go, I will hit him with the fucking hose every hour on the hour. Let me do it. <laughs> Lay out, spray this motherfucker. <laughs> so, yeah, they, but then the island ends. You know, you take the C-130 back, and now they're saying, okay... Um, well, they, they read our orders 
on the island where we're going. So, and the, I, I don't know if, if they still do this, but we used to do a dream sheet. You put your th top three SEAL teams in a row, which to me was like, this is cool. Where, where do I want to go? And I think an, uh, a guy that I knew said, um, don't put, I mean, obviously put which team you want first, but then put the other teams on that coast. Mm -hmm. Because you might not get two, but you will get eight, which is awesome. Whatever you do, do not put SDV anywhere. Yeah. I mean, it sounded like a good deal at the time because you get free fall. And that's like the only good deal. Uh, but apparently SDV is a motherfucker. Yeah. So uh, I put SEAL Team 2, SEAL Team 8, SEAL Team 4, because they're all on the East Coast. Uh, and at the time, uh, the only real work we were getting was Bosnia, Kosovo, and SEAL Team 2. That was their AL. So I kind of wanted to go to SEAL Team 2+. Plus, you know, one of the first two SEAL teams. Yeah. Which to me, just seemed like a, a... To me, I still love to say SEAL Team 2. That's awesome. And um, I'll never forget, they were reading our orders, and they're like, so-and-so, SEAL Team 3, so-and-so, SEAL Team 1. They go, O'Neill, SDV, sorry, SEAL Team 2. In that one second, I'm like, no! <laughs> SDV 2? You're ready to quit right oh, there. Dude. You made it all the way through. That's You're like, I'm doing, like, 12-hour dives in the Chesapeake Bay in February. Fuck that. No, thank you. Yeah, but I got SEAL Team 2, and then and then all of a sudden, you are um, you know, get, go to medical, get your shit done, go to dental, get checked up, and then go to Fort Benning. And it's like, holy shit, Buds is over. Yeah. Now what? I have to be a Navy SEAL. What does that even mean? And then you go to Benning, and, and uh, I'd never worked with um, the Army before. And it was just cool, again, because I you know, looked up to the Army. Rangers are fucking studs. And uh, I went, and they're, they're, these are kids that look like me in Army uniforms. And like they're asking me about Buds, and I'm asking them about BASIC. And then we're going through, um, through Airborne, which is just a clown show. <laughs> Yeah, just I mean because the army makes those instructors do that, to keep your attention that ridiculous dancing around shit. Well, they hate us too. Oh, they, they hate. hate us. They, I would hate us. Yeah, good imagine the, the worst thing that they could have done is send. I didn't mean to say a clown show. Airborne, obviously, rich history. It just some of the shit they did was a clown show. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, imagine taking someone at nineteen or twenty years old, just finished the hardest military training in the world, and you know your punishment is to do to do ten push-ups. You need to do two pull-ups before you go into the chow hall. All right. Yeah. Two pull-ups, how many times? A <laughs> hundred? <laughs> but no, I mean, that was cool. And then, I, but, but then, in their defense too, and obviously, you know, inner service, we, we make fun of each other. Uh, you, you know that. Um, but then the first jump, I, I mean, it took a while. Like, I'm convinced you can teach someone how to fall and push them out of a plane in one day. But they take their time, and you're in those gravel pits or whatever, falling. Um, but the first time I jumped, the first time under canopy, and I landed in, in one of the uh, black hats. One of the instructors said, I was that. And I was like, that is the coolest thing I've ever done. So that was awesome. You see, and then all of a sudden, bam, you go to SEAL Team 2. You didn't have uh, SQT back then? No, no. We went through SEAL tactical training. What we, was that? Uh, I, I went was, through SQT, so okay. I don't know what that it was. was. Well, um, it's a 13-week course that they ran two times a year. So you get there. You're in the training department with the older guys, and then you... Um, you um, Wait until you're classed up, so you can volunteer to. You're a you know picking up brass and shit. Okay. Actually, that's where I met Don Shipley, Senior Chief Don Shipley. The first, I think, one of the first seals I ever met. He came in. Uh, just if you if, if if Don Shipley to this day is one of the coolest motherfuckers I've ever met. <laughs> he came in in his khaki. I'm a new guy, like I'm trying to blend into the nothing. And he, he came in in his khakis. He goes, "Oh fuck it, who wants to come with me to the Chiefs Club and get a beer?" I was like, "I would love to." No, you're not going. <laughs> I I would. And uh, Shipley just turned out to be one. Like he was, he was so cool. And we did, uh, we would, I would volunteer to jump with the platoons, uh, just to get. I want to get the gold wings. That's your next goal. I don't have a trident yet. You have to get through SEAL tactical training, which is thirteen weeks, uh, and then a six month probationary period. So I, I want to get the gold wings at least. So I'm, I'm a new meat, but I'm not that new. Yeah. And I remember jumping once with Don Shipley, and just like, I mean, so these static land jumps, and he turns back, and he's doing the, the jump master win thing, and he kind of goes. <laughs> and us. We had dudes in the trees, like, eh, was he's like, uh, yeah. let's go to the bar. We're, well, yeah, we're not staring this canopy. Just get out. <laughs> and then, S so SCT was um, was run at um, we first part was in um, uh, Puerto Rico for uh, combat diving, and that was different than um, than buds diving because now I mean they're legitimately teaching you how to dive, how to do your kick count, how to get your your shit right, and you're, you're wearing the the wetsuit you want or don't want, what makes you comfortable. 
and then just doing like a tur turtle backing, which, you know, that's the worst part, but then you do the four hour dives and two a day, and then up to camp uh, or Fort AP Hill in Northern Virginia. And um, then you do all the land warfare. It's basically land warfare, uh, then demo, a lot of demo. One of the best uh, demo experiences I had, best and worst was, um, so Master Chief Pig Wagner was running it. He's a Vietnam guy and, and he's up there running the show because he didn't give a fuck. And we had always read that you can light C4 on fire and it won't do anything. It'll turn into a vapor. We'd read it. I ain't doing it, right? So he pulled us out the first day and he's like, yeah, okay, we, you two are going to come up here and you're going to light this and around the class and prove. And I remember, I don't know if I had the lighter or Bob, my buddy had the lighter, but one of us did. And as soon as we, it flicked, he set off a four pound charge <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> they did that same shit to me. Did you blush it with they you? Did, they did that in yeah. Bud's. Yeah, like, apparently it's a good go-to, but yeah. it worked. But then then you light it, like, oh, you can do this. And then you learn about C4. Like you can, you can do anything to C4. It's not... I mean, it needs that violent uh, blasting cap, yeah. basically. Yeah, so we did that, and then you go back to SEAL Team 2, and then they have a um, uh, six months of you're in, uh, they're observing you. like, And so SEAL Team 2, they're keeping time. How fast do you run the old course? How fast was your base tour? How fast was your swim? They're timing you, and they're watching you, and they're being pricks. And I had a dude check in. Uh his last name was Courier, Master Chief. I didn't know he was a Master Chief. I didn't know he was about to be the command Master Chief. Because uh, oh, young looking guy, red hair, looks nice. And um, <laughs> he seemed like a nice <laughs> he guy. Had a, he had a damn <laughs> locker. Of, and I didn't, I'd never seen him before. And he's a young looking dude. I'm like, that was, you know, I'm, I'm about to be a team guy. And so anyway, so we went to, uh, <laughs> we were going to the O course. So that there's two O courses at Little Creek, as you know. And this, there's a small one and the big one. And the small one is just for time. It's like you're, you're running in your you know, monkey bars or whatever, uh, uh, parallel ladder, whatever they call it, shit. And then you know, jump over this and run, you're running it for time. You do three of those, then you do a big loop and do three more, and then you go back to the team and the, you know, whoever wins, wins. And I was chasing Art Tolke. Uh, so I'm a new guy, 20 years old. And Art Tolke is one of the one percenters who he will, he will beat you at everything. Um, so I'm, I want to, I can run fast. I'm still fast from Buzz. And so I'm like going through the little thing and then I'm going through the tires and uh, I hear that dude Courier. Um, yelling at me, stop skipping every other tire because I'm just trying to haul ass. So I'm running around and, I'm, and he goes, uh, he yells at me from one of the, he's yelling across now at the old course at me. He's like, I thought I said you should stop skipping every other tire. And I, I yell at him, yeah, and if you were fucking fast enough, you see me skip every other monkey bar. Or something <laughs> like so um, I'm just yelling at a, a team guy because my trident board is that day. Now I get my, my camis on, I go to the trident board, guess who's in the center of it? That guy, Mark Courier. The Command Master Chief. Oh, shit. Yeah, and I just told him to fuck himself on the O-Course. So he decides whether or not I'm going to try it. And he goes, you're the guy skipping every other monkey bar. Why do you do that? You need to cheat? And I said, I go, yeah, to beat our token, you do. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a long trident board. I did get it that day. And then and then now you get assigned to a platoon. Right on. And that's just one. I mean, that's that's like a brief... It's a, every moment in time of how to get there. And then now you, then they, you get your trident, and then you get your blood wings. I'm not, they're allowed to do that. Yeah. And now you're a Navy SEAL. So looking back through that whole pipeline, was, was there ever a time you wanted to quit? Every day, in buds. Yeah, what got you through? Um, everyone who said I couldn't do it. Yeah. Just the, I don't, I'm not going to go home with this. Seems to be the common denominator. I think it is. I mean, it's, it's not because, uh, well, because it wasn't hard. I want to quit every day. Yeah. Fuck those ocean swims. Yeah. Fuck the, the the conditioning runs. The mind the mind games on the soft sand runs when you're finally coming back after five miles and you go right to the compound or right past it. What was the hardest part for you? Um, I think the swims, just because my times were just there. They they put me with a, a good swimmer because I wasn't a good swimmer and he could guide. Uh, the key, you know as we know the key to uh, ocean swims is guiding, getting there straight. Because if you're doing this number, you're just adding. To it, so I would just stare at Monty, and uh, and he would swim, and I would just kick, and we, you know, got through that. But yeah, that was that. So you got into Team Two, right? Mm -hmm. you started at Team Two, and what were you guys doing? What was going on in the world? Um, a little bit of Bosnia still, um, Sarajevo, okay. Um, and I don't think anybody had killed anybody yet, so we didn't really know what was happening but that, that's kind of what it was and, and uh, I was assigned to um, a Marg platoon on an amphib ship um, 
the USS Austin, which is an Austin class LPD, which oh, means man. it's the original. So we crossed the ocean on a on a flat bottom LPD, which is <laughs> horrific. And as a Navy SEAL on a boat, you don't have much to do. Um, I I did. I took advantage of it. I would go around to different shops and see how um, how they worked, what the quartermaster was doing, what they do in the airloft, how's the what's a steering like, and and uh, boats is made cool motherfuckers. Um, and and, th- and that's that's another part where a lot of team guys, if you can imagine, are cocky to fleet sailors. And I would tell a lot of SEALs, because I did a couple cruises on ships, I would say, you know, there are guys on the ship that work a hell of a lot harder than you do. Navy life's no joke. Yeah. And I just tried to learn about it. Um, and um, I met the Marines. We had, it was my first time working with uh, amphibious reconnaissance. Uh, cool dudes. Great dudes. And we went over there. And all we were going to do was um, training exercises. We went, I mean, we went to Rota, Spain. I don't know how many times. Italy, like 11 times. And um, we did get, so I, I actually, I'm sorry, I went through sniper school before that deployment. So they, t- turns out Chief John Judy, who was my recruiter, did not lie to me. They would send me to sniper school and just get through butts first. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see him again. I mean, I, I, that was awesome. He was, he was never, he was never mean to me. He just kind of, yeah, you're good. Um, and so I did go to sniper school at Camp Atterbury, which is awesome. And, and that sniper course is based off of uh, the Marine Corps sniper school. Um, so when I got on, on the ship, when we're not doing anything, I would get with the the recon snipers, and we would just talk about ballistics and talk about minutes of angle and how you do this. And wh- how do you set up your hide set? What do you prefer as far as sh- taking shots and uh, picking picking their brains? Because you know, there's no internet, and there's you can read your books, you can lift. Yeah. What are you gonna do for the next ten hours? So bullshit with them. Um, and then we we actually got called in to uh, at, at the time it was a real world mi- real world mission to go into Albania because there was an exercise going on with some admirals, and I think the like the president of Albania, and then there was a terrorist threat. So this is 1998, and that was the first time in the Navy that I'd heard Osama bin Laden. Oh, so no shit. So Al-Qaeda is threatening this exercise. Al-Qaeda is run by, Os- like one of the briefs, Osama bin Laden, like, yeah, I heard of him because of the thing in, in 93 when they bombed. Yeah, okay, I know who that is. But he wasn't, you know, yeah. Osama bin Laden yet. Um, and so we, I mean, I did get briefed on it and, you know, we're never going to see him, but I, I got to set up like my first range card. I'm overwatching this award ceremony. I'm like, this is kind of cool. I mean, if Al Qaeda pops out, I'll just, I'll shoot one of them. And, uh, and that'll be it. That'll be it. <laughs> we'll go get a beer. Yeah, that's it. Um, no, but that was like the first thing. Like we, we did, we did some security on, um, on the housing complex, the embassy. And that's actually the first time I saw SEAL Team 6 guys, because I had been told they, they were doing, um, PSD, personal protection on a lot of, uh, big wigs at the embassy. And uh, I, I'd been told that SEAL Team Six had been disbanded; it doesn't exist anymore. And I, I saw them. And one of the older guys, the platoon goes, "Yeah, those are those are Dev Group guys. That's SEAL Team 6. And I was like, "Those fucking guys are legends." Yeah. First time I saw them, first time I heard Bin Laden, and then we go back to Virginia Beach after a, eight months at sea and um, start another workup. And then it's a part of the the team guy life, where you know they call them the one hump chumps. Mm-hmm. The most cocky guys at a SEAL team are the guys with one platoon. Because I know everything now. I'm yeah. not a meat anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you, you are to somebody. <laughs> I ran into a guy. You Know your heritage. Um, you, you're a meat to somebody. You're a new guy to somebody. I ran into it. So I'm a cocky one hump chomp. I'm at the SEAL reunion in Virginia Beach. And you know how you see those old school badass dudes like the big trident hats? Yeah. And I saw this old dude. He's a little too old. Whatever. Me being cocky. And I go, hey, uh, wh- what buds class were you? Oh, shit. And he said... Uh, well, I went through Hell Week in um, 1944, and I said, there was no Hell Week in 1944. He said, there was on Omaha Beach. Know your heritage. I'm like, holy shit. Damn, dude. That yeah, old school guy. I mean, that's, I'm, again, goosebumps. Holy shit. So that's when I learned, to just, you don't know, don't talk shit. You don't know who knows what. Yeah. Never start a fight, because you're probably going to lose. That's fucking cool. Yeah, that, that's kind of, that's a cool thing. It's like, I want to fuck with an old guy. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then another platoon. We uh, we got spun up quickly to do a strike platoon on um, the USS Kennedy. So we did a shortened workup, and they actually the only reason I got in they, they made a quick platoon of experienced guys. I don't know why, but uh, I got picked because uh, I was a sniper, and they needed a sniper. One of our guys was a radio guy. They picked him, and another guy um, uh, just a linguist or some shit. And then we got into a a pretty stacked platoon, and uh, we went overseas. And and we did a couple things. We um, we we were doing the the interdiction operations in the Persian Gulf. We you, like you're taking down Dow's, mm. a date smuggler. We uh, we I uh, we took down the U.S. or the the Russian tanker Volganeft 
which was a big deal at the time. It was a smuggled Iraqi oil. You know, I mean, the, the closest we got to combat was, I think we confiscated their steak knives. And then we drove it to Oman, and then we finished that platoon, and then <clears throat> time to another platoon. And um, I did a Yukon this time, so I went to, to Germany. Were you getting discouraged at all? or uh, No, because I thought I was getting real work. I mean, we really went in with loaded weapons. We really took down ships, and not a lot going on. Yeah. And then uh, I knew we'd get to, we'd do a pump in Kosovo on this one, for sure. And I'm like, okay, that's, I mean... There have been a couple shoot shootouts there. I will get to um, to try out my hide side skills Be, I, because I guess a lot of the a lot of the seals, a lot of that we're doing it, we're getting compromised um, by farmers, and that's how you start learning. Okay, you're in someone's backyard; they they're gonna recognize you. Yeah. And so we learned about that. You know, I did a couple hide sites in Kosovo, Camp Bond Steel, ate really good food, and then we left um, back to Germany. And now we oh, I've been to Kosovo. I'm, this is my third platoon. You know, I can be the shit at JB's Gallery of Girls when I go back home or whatever. <coughs> is that place still there? I have no idea. That was, I love that place. It was called Stopless go <laughs> not Topless, because they had the little things on. Wasn't it right next to the, uh, what was that bar right next to it? It was right next to it. The um, Brass. The the Brass Bell? The Brass Bell. Yeah. I wonder if that's I don't know if it's still there. there. I haven't been back there. But yeah, we, we, so we're back in, uh, at Unit 2 up in Germany, just finished Kosovo, and then I was in the um, uh, operations room. Uh, type, we did have email at the time, because it was September 2001. And um, we saw the TV come on, and they, they had a picture of the Twin Towers, the North Tower was on fire. And they said, um, obviously this is breaking news, a, a small plane has hit the World Trade Center. And we're looking at it, and... You know, we're trying to think through it. Like, that's a that's a nice day, man. That's clear. And that is not a small hole because that's a huge building. That's a big fucking hole, man. And then the second one hit. Yeah. And we're kind of... And someone did say, that's Osama bin Laden. That's Al-Qaeda, man. Everything, everything that we know just changed right now. So we're deployed. And it's like, well, all right. I mean, where do you want us to go? We're overseas. And it didn't happen. Um, they did obviously send guys right in, and and then we went back. And I I, I put in that's when I put in my um, uh, my package for um, green team. Do I want to go to SEAL Team Six now? So when you saw the when you saw the planes hit the towers, did you have any recollection of Bin Laden's name from before when you were going? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we talked about Al Qaeda just in some some briefs here and there. Okay. Uh, yeah, and we knew they were a threat, but we never knew it was that. And we. When they first hit, we're thinking we're going to Sudan or some maybe fighting in Africa or whatever. And then they obviously figured out where they were. And uh, I put in my package, and, and I had a, I had enough time between going going to Green Team um, to do another deployment. So I got on another another Marg deployment, and I'm like, this is going to be sweet because we're going to go in with the Marines through Turkey, and we're going to because now it's 2003. I mean, that's kind of a I jumped some time there. But we're gonna now we're invading Iraq, <clears throat> and we talked about this earlier. Like for whatever Iraq was worth, I was excited because we're gonna invade a country. I'm a Navy SEAL, and we are gonna we're gonna kill. Yeah, and I want to because we're all still fired up about. I mean, that's how that's how we got away with invading Iraq because of what happened on 9/11. Um, and then with me being the, I don't know what it is about me, but there, there turned out to be um, a problem in Monrovia, Liberia, with the embassy. There was a civil war. And they wanted to evacuate the embassy, so they literally turned us around. So the Marines are off. Oh shit! And they're going to oh, man. I mean, and they and we did talk to them afterwards, and they invaded Iraq. I mean, that's fucking an invasion. So, yeah. um, but we went back, and and um, <laughs> so instead of going into a gunfight, I did my my first and only real world hydrographic reconnaissance. <sighs> so, and the what the the funniest part of that was that because. You know, you always get um, um, briefed on dangerous marine life, but whatever. I don't give a shit. It's, they're not going to hurt you. But this one we paid attention to, and they said, because you're going to be swimming in on, on the coast of Africa, and it, there's every man-eating shark you can imagine is here. And um, I, there shouldn't be any, but um, if you see saltwater crocodiles, they're 20 feet long, they'll eat you. And then now, <laughs> there, aren't any, there are, aren't any hippos, but those are the deadliest animal in Africa, they kill more people than anything. Oh, and here's your landing point. It's called Black Mamba Point. The reason it's called Black Mamba Point is because it's full of black mamas, and they're very aggressive. They'll chase you and they'll kill you. <laughs> After that, it's like, 
All right. So, and then even when we flooded the 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 well deck of the of the USS LaSalle to get off, there were hammerheads that were like swimming into the ship. Holy shit! So what the shit. fuck is this? Yeah. Like, so, can we just go to the fucking invasion? It's, it's, can we go to Iraq? Yeah, but I know we you know went into the did a hydro recon. That was kind of cool because we did the the no shit thing and the Marines did come. I think the Marines came in by helicopter. It's like. You're welcome. <laughs> they, oh man, dude. Yeah. But yeah, then we um, so we didn't have time to to invade Iraq, and then we went back, and then um, I was a master at arms at SEAL Team Four, for um, like January to March when Green Team started. So I ran PT, and then uh, went to selection. And so then you go over there, and it's like, all right, here, fuck, because I mean, Green Team is um, you're putting your trident on, the, on, you're betting your trident right now, because you'll either be the guy that made it or the guy that tried and didn't. Yeah, that's a lot of. I mean, that's a lot to, to to deal with, and you can get kicked out of selection for anything. Like I've seen really, really good dudes just fuck something up and they're gone. Yeah, have a bad day, and everyone has a bad day. Throw the wrong shot though, you're fucking out. Back when you went through though, there probably wasn't as many guys going to green team. No, I don't think so. How many guys were going in? Um, we went with about sixty. And then, sixty. And we got like thirty through. Okay. Well, that's half. I think sixty, but I mean, they did spin up to the point where they did two. They were doing two green teams a year. Yeah, and that was just a different animal, um, because you're not going to get quitters. You usually won't get quitters. So they're trying to they're trying to find guys who can think through problems, who can think, who can who can make decisions, you know, rapidly. Who's not going to freeze at the door? And I've seen dudes do it. You know, uh, in a in a in a close quarters combat situation. You got a breaching problem. I've seen guys freeze at the door. Like they, they forget to look for the hinge. They forget which goes where. And it's all right. And it's sort of the if you want to be fast, slow down. If you want to deal with chaos, breathe. And I tell people that now uh, at, at boardrooms. If you're having a shitty meeting, stand up and breathe. Uh, and that's so you know learning learning the uh, the slowest, smoothest, smoothest, fast, and you get through it. And, and I you know I've had days where. Because CQB is the notoriously hardest part of Green Team when you're because they just they really just hammer you for shit. Um, I've had days where I can do no wrong. Three runs in a row, everything's smooth. It's fucking easy to the point where the last run of the day they have me carrying a broom because they told me I'm not safe with a gun. Just getting in your head, and what they will do there is uh, punish you for things you didn't screw up, but hammer you for it. Like what? Can you give me an example? Um, over penetration. You, you, you're supposed to be six, six inches from the wall. You're four inches from the wall. Get outside. And they just are hammering you, tire drags, sweating, dehydrated, uh, getting in your own head. What did I do? I know I didn't fuck that. They know you didn't fuck it up, but they, you don't know that they know that you didn't fuck up. Because, and as soon as you're done getting beat, they put you right back in the front of the train and you're, and this is when you haul ass through that. You're not slowing down in this. You're running fast because what they're telling you is, um, we just punished you for something you didn't fuck up. Can you get over it, or is it going to stay in your head? Okay. And some of the best advice, again, in life is whatever it is, get over it. Learn from it and get the fuck over it. Uh, you know, you're not getting that playback. Learn and move on. Well, how would you compare a green team to buds? Is it is it harder, but harder? different? Because you're doing the ten mile run in the morning, but then it's not. Then it's just tactics. Um, with skydiving, it's just a, a lot of shit. Uh, hey hos, hey lows, uh, combat jumps, all that stuff. Um, and then the CQB is just, it's repetition and it's just, uh, I, it's just, it's the constant scrutiny. It's, it's so many instructors hammering you at once. It, it, uh, and it just, it's, it's a mind game. I mean, it's, it's, it is the best time of your life. It's just hard. Yeah. What, uh, would you say there's like a certain attribute they're looking for in an operator to get over there or? You know, it's, it's hard to say because you, it's, it's like buds where you can't pick who's going to make it and who's not. I mean, you, I mean, you, you can, he's going to make, he's going to, but I don't know about these guys, like the gray man is going to, the gray man wins there too. Um, um, I think, but, but uh, green team's more of a, if if they like you from the beginning, or if like it's kind of a good old boy network too, like someone says, hey, th you do want this guy, they're going to. I mean, you know, they're going to hammer him. They're not going to know that they're kind of looking out for him. But yeah. if they don't like you, you're fucked. Like if like they'll if they pass your picture around the the the, uh, the team rooms and someone knows you from CP Shuckers, oh fuck him. That's it. That's, That's all it could takes. Could be. Could be. Damn. That's how it was. I think then. 
Uh, and I was fortunate. I was I was liked by a few a few guys, and um, you know I fucked things up. I mean everyone fucks things up, but uh, I, I think I kind of got it. Um, just the slow, slowing it down, the, the realization. It's like with a golf swing. If you watch yourself swing, how fast you're bringing it. Slow the fuck down. Keep your yeah. head still. Well, let's uh, let's take a quick break, yeah. and then we'll get into the rest of it. Hey guys, let me tell you about this subscription service that I've been working real hard on called Vigilance Elite Patreon. Basically on Patreon, we have it broken up into three different tiers. We got tier one, tier two, and tier three. Let's dive in. Our tier one patrons get all the behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. That could include behind the scenes photos, that could be side conversations that we have in between breaks, that could be specific questions that our patrons give us for the guest on the Sean Ryan show, and a ton of bonus content that doesn't really fit into any specific category. For our Tier 2 patrons, they get access to our tactical training library, which consists of well over 100 videos. We've broken those videos up into separate categories, and those categories are rifle fundamentals, pistol fundamentals, drills, tactics, driving, gear and weapon setups, and everybody's favorite, mindset. Also on Tier 2, you will get a live update from me on the 1st and the 15th of every month where we talk about the upcoming guests on the Sean Ryan Show, plus all the benefits of Tier 1. Our top tier, which is Tier 3, gets full access to all the other tiers Plus, they get full access to me, where we do video teleconferencing, VTC, once a month. We discuss anything from tactics to current events to who's coming on the show. I take suggestions, and it's very interactive. No matter what tier you choose, the support is greatly appreciated, and it is the only thing that makes this show drive on. So thank you for all the support. See you on Patreon. All right, so we kind of got through Green Team. Yep. You're showing up. You're done. How do you? How do they figure out what squadron well, you, you're going you, to? Once, once you do realize that SEAL Team Six exists and it's not a you know a development squad, it is. I mean, you're developing shit, but then you're shooting people um, <laughs> with it. <laughs> uh, um, the, the squadrons at the time, or the two original squadrons, f were um, blue and gold for Navy. And, and actually, the reason it's called SEAL Team 6 is because Mar Dick Marcinko, just a, a phenomenal ultimate Navy SEAL, who was the commanding officer, he, he called it 6 because he knew Russia would say, there's SEAL Team 1, 2, and 6. Where the hell are 3, 4, and 5? Not, you know, not just a hat rack. Yeah. Um, but we, we, there was, so uh, when I got there, there was, there was blue and gold and then gold, uh, they absorbed into red squadron, which is the one I wanted to go to. Um, why did you want to go there? Um, they, well, th because of Neil Roberts. Okay. Uh, he was, he was obviously Roberts Ridge and that was red squadron, red team at the time <clears throat> that went into Takagar and he fell out of the helicopter and that, that, that's the first time it really sunk in that, um, we're fighting some fucking animals. This yeah. is Al Qaeda, and they're not going to just kill you. you did you know Neil? I did. He was one of the first Navy SEALs I met. I met Don Shipley. I met Neil Roberts. Neil Roberts took me and my friend Matt to lunch at Arby's. I'll never forget that. Brand new guys, SEAL Team Two, and he was just always so willing to help you with anything, from the finance rate you're getting on that car at that stupid used car lot off base to here's where you put your sixty pouches. Okay, look, come here. This girl's crazy. Get away from her. Neil Roberts is the guy, and you know his name is Neil Roberts, Robert O'Neill, uh, and he was a red hair. I mean, a complete stud. Like uh, he was way b better than than me. Like I, th I think his O course time is on his headstone still, because he had the record for so long, which I think is fucking awesome. Yeah. But he was just the he was he, a one percenter, um, and uh, but in, in every way, salt of the earth, um, nicest guy in the world. He can murder you with a knife, like just awesome guy. And just because of, of the, the the fight at Talker Gar, the 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 story of what happened, everything from Chapman to to Slab, 
what they did on that mountain, Brett Morgani, the guys, how they, how they just never leave anyone behind, and they went back. And they got in one of the worst gunfights you can imagine, close, close quarters with PKMs getting shot at you at night. And just to hear, I, and I'm not going to tell their story, I wasn't there, to, but just to hear them um, debrief us, I was like, okay, I want to go to, I mean, the Bones, man, blue team, awesome, gold team, doesn't take shit, awesome, but I just wanted red. Um, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go to the other ones, because, I mean, it was even cool to go through green team, because the instructors were all at squadrons, and as a new guy looking at the Trident, I felt like that looking at the Bones, looking at the, at the, at the Crusader. Damn. Looking at the, 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 the red man. And I just wanted red team. I just, I felt it. And, Did they uh, give you a choice or? No, they, you get picked. They have, um, they, uh, they, they actually have drafts. And um, every year, one team is first. And, no and then shit. you rotate. And then every, every time you're at your pick, one troop or one team gets their first pick. So you actually go through a, you actually go through a process. I actually picked DJ Shipley. And I'll never forget when it was my turn to pick. I was like, that guy's still available? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Our team just got better. <laughs> no shit. So how's yeah. it how does it work then? Do they do, do you um, the instructors giving you Yeah, yeah, cuz you have insight. You, yeah, you you're you're playing the good old boy network. Like the red team instructors are coming up to red team saying, "I'm not going to say anything you want. This guy, here's the order that you want to go." And we want him in the squadron, but like if your team can get him. Um, yeah, it's fucking Awesome. So I just, I got red and I don't know why, but I remember they, they posted the uh, 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 list on the, on the cork board and it's like, okay, you see the guys, it's like, oh, sweet man, you know, um, Reeves got gold and that's awesome. And, and, um, uh, my Coke is going to gold and oh, look at me and Nate, we're at, we're at red and this, and it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, you're, you all made it. So you're going to know each other. We call it the second deck. Once you get to the second deck is when you're part of a squadron. And then going into the second deck, for the first day is, um, shit, I'm a new guy again. And the first thing I remember walking into the red, red team room was, uh, obviously it's, it's the way it's just, the the way it's designed, the memorabilia shit. I'm Neil Roberts fucking bent saw is up there in a frame above the desk where he used to sit. Wow. Now, but it's like, it's from reading history to being now you're a part of it. But now it's like, holy fuck, I'm scared of these guys. Uh, what impressed me the most was how fast they could do CQB. Like, try, like if you're not in the front, you're, you're, they're gone. They're going to dust this place. But the second thing was how funny they were. The humor and the camaraderie. Like, the, oh my God, I thought I was funny. I got to step up because these dudes are <laughs> funny. And they're just good dudes. Like, like, uh, and I, I maintained that uh, up until the last day. <clears throat> my last day at SEAL Team 6. I was lucky because every single day I got to go to work with people who were better than me. And, and we didn't necessarily undermine each other. We, we, would, we would ask each other questions. Well, you do this. Why, why does that work? And what do you think about that? And how should I carry this? I got to a point where I was telling, uh, telling my guys, uh, you don't need to carry a pistol. And they're like, why is that? And I'm like, well, if you get into a room and you, your primary goes down, your buddy already killed him. And if you go outside with a pistol, just fucking bring, bring a cleaning rod or throw rocks at him. Clean your fucking gun. Like, this pistol's not doing shit. It's weight. You're carrying yeah. weight. Take that shit off your gun. It's not a space gun. You need you need your EOTech and a laser and an extra battery for your nods because it's going to fail. Yeah. Change your batteries every day. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but the first day there, just watching them work and then seeing how, how, how they work together and the humor and the camaraderie. And, and uh, that's what I think makes a great team is morale. They always made sure morale was high. Uh, little things like, uh, you guys have anything to do? Go home. Be with your kids. We're not doing shit today leave and uh it, and it was um it was a uh big boy mentality like um our first muster is going to be 10 a.m i'm a, i'm just assuming you will have gone in and worked out by then yeah and we did and it wasn't like organized pt or march to the surf zone it's like do your thing can you can you carry me if i get shot in my body armor are you doing those workouts then we have no problem and then, uh, and then you do the, you know, we got there, we're doing a work and it was just like, now it's like over there, it wasn't new guy. It was like newer guy. And okay. instead of like, fuck you, you idiot. It's like, here, let me show you how that, come on. Let me, uh, let me show you a quick way to make that seven foot charge of C6. Come on, watch this. So and it's actually pretty fucking welcoming. Yeah, it is. A green team, they fucking hammer you. Yeah. But it's, they all, they all go through it. And then once you're through like I, I saw, um, green team instructors, 
that I thought were the, the meanest motherfuckers in the world. When you, once you get to the second deck, it's forgotten. It's a game. We just, I want you, uh, it's the same in Buds. They're fucking hammering you because I will have to go to war with you. I might. Can you, can you do it? Yeah. But then you get up there and it's like, you, I mean, you get, you got friends everywhere, you know everybody. And, um, and, and now we're going to war. And I mean, other than a, a couple things, um, we weren't losing a lot of fights. So it didn't really hit, you know, my first deployment, well, that's when it hit. Because my first deployment was to um, Jalalabad, Afghanistan. We were running a safe house, which is um, some guys cooler than me and probably a three-letter agency carried a briefcase full of money and bought a small hotel and then hired locals to be security and plumbers and shit cooks. And then here's your safe house. And you're, it's a safe house because <clears throat> you're, you're stimulating the economy. You're, you're paying the guards, and they will work for money. Um, you're shopping in the bazaars. You're eating shawarmas out in town. And then, you know, the family around you doesn't want to get mortared, so they'll make sure that Taliban doesn't come in. And that's my first one. And uh, I didn't, um, I'd never been to war. And I'd only seen it on TV, so I assumed it was as bad as it was on TV. I assumed... There's a suicide bomber around every corner. Everyone's going to be shooting at you. It's going to blow up all the time. Um, and it took a while to realize that in a war zone, most of the people just want to get on with their lives and raise their families. Most of the people are not combatants. They're just fucking over it. Um, but the first few times, we were doing some new technology in Jalalabad. We're doing, uh, um, so it's now we're doing Mount in Jabad. So and, hold on, just for the audience, yeah, Mount is uh, just... Military operations, urban terrain. So it's it's uh, urban urban fighting. So it's like everywhere. It's a it's a not just a 360 range. It's everything range, and you can get shot at from anywhere, and you don't even know why. Something can blow up. Everything next to you can blow up. Um, and I remember thinking that I'm, I'm kind of wasting my energy, jumping behind shit, and, you know, there's... I think we had four dudes. That's four, it? Four guys from Red Team, two included... So, Three uh, SEALs, one EOD. But at that time, EOD was going through Green Team with us. So, I mean, they're shooters. And uh, I remember jumping around, like, looking around. And, and uh, I looked at my uh, my boss, who was... Uh, he was involved in Operation Anaconda, where um, Robert Ridge happened. And he'd, he'd been awarded the Silver Star for some of the shit they did. And I was watching him. And I remember looking over, and he's got, like, body armor, short sleeves, big old beard. Like, he's got like, one, of those, one of those cop radios. And just... And I remember looking at him thinking... I want to be cool like that. I want to look cool like that. And uh, we got we got back, and I, I told him, I'm not kissing your ass, but how, how weren't you afraid? And he goes, well, how do you know I wasn't afraid? I said, because you didn't look like it. And he goes, well, that's right. You don't know if I'm afraid, but if I show you that I'm calm, you'll be calm. Calm is contagious. And, and that's how you learn. It's like, okay, that's fucking cool. I just got to look cool. And so we did a couple things here and there. Well, like one of the One of the funniest things I saw was um, we, we learned that if, if you run into a, a foreign fighter is uh, anyone not from Afghanistan, or if you're not Iraq, anyone not from Iraq. So you got Jordanians or Saudi Arabians, and if you run into them, they look different, they speak Arabic. They're there for one reason. Right? They're not teaching school. They're Al-Qaeda. Yeah. We ran into, uh, I, was, uh, I got a, a very short course in how to be a battlefield interrogator. So my job was to, and we, we invented these tactics as we, as we went along. Uh, as soon as we took a house down, shots fired or not, whoever's surviving, we're interrogating them right now. You know, put the interpreter behind him. I'm interrogating you because you catch them with their pants down. They're nervous. They don't know how to, how to act. I ran into a Saudi Arabian's big fat dude, and I instantly started laughing. I, I said to him through the interpreter, I said, you don't know what that T-shirt you're wearing says, do you? And he had no idea. His T-shirt said, it's not a beer belly. It's a fuel tank for a sex machine. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm like, you just you just saved yourself a beating because that's awesome. I wish you had a picture of that. Yeah. Oh, I, I wish I had that shirt. If I'd have known any better, I'd take it from. You. Made an NFT out of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we were doing that kind of stuff, and and um, it was it was that's what we do. I'm getting to know the locals. I'm getting to know a little bit of the traditions, how how you do this, getting to know the local food. Um, you know, even driving to Asadabad up the Konar River at the time. Because we were doing it right, and we didn't, we hadn't pissed off everyone yet where there's IEDs. But um, one one night, we we would drive dirt bikes around town, um, locals that we would purchase the the local bikes. You know, put put on the the Protec drive to. This is when the airfield wasn't built up. This is the, like there was still Russian shit there, 
and uh, like the Rangers stayed there, the Ranger sniper teams were there, a couple Marines were there and stuff, and, and we, uh, they're putting up a few tents here and there, and uh, they said, hey, some guys uh, from the East Coast just flew in, um, some helicopters. I was like, fuck, let's go see them. And so we drove over there, that turned out to be a Turbine 3-3, and we, I bullshitted with some of those dudes. Talked to Dan Healy about um, Sam Adams. Uh, I went to sniper school with Dan Healy, and he loves Sam Adams. He's a New Englander. And uh, we're like, what's the, what's the deal? And they said, um, we just inserted four snipers into um, the Korangal, the Korangal Valley. They're looking for Ahmad Shah. And then once they find him with eyes on, um, we're going to go hit the house. And, and we were like, fuck, yeah, can we go? And so we were, we were trying to work at skiing because our, our headshed from, from six was in Bodrum. And they told us, no, no one from SEAL Team 6 is getting on those helicopters. We think there's missiles. And um, we were like, yeah, cool, man. Fucking have a, have a good fight. And I had a, some of my guys were down front maybe so we took them back to our, uh, uh, our safe house. And we had some contingency funds that you're supposed to use to build up the, um, the, um, the infrastructure. So we had some dude build this stupid cold tub, like the size of a hot tub, but it's cold. And we were just sitting there. We could get Heineken um, over there. So we were sitting there having... And actually, the, the Heineken story is funny because we, with a, when I first got there, they had a place where we could send the interpreter to get booze for us. I mean, obviously, no one drinks overseas. But um, <laughs> we sent them there. And the, the price was, uh, I want to say, 20 bucks for a bottle of Stolichnaya vodka and 30 bucks for a case of Heineken. And so we sent the Terps out. My Terp was Larry because we couldn't pronounce his name. So he's just Larry. And uh, we sent him out to get some stuff. And uh, I'm I'm the newer guy there, but I'm now you know I'm I'm over there, and uh, he came back with nothing. He said, "Yeah, the the guy running the shop said I know who you're selling this to. These are for the Americans, and the prices went from twenty and thirty to fifty and 60. And I'm like, "Fuck this! Are you kidding me? Get your shit on!" So we roll over there and we go to the guy. Look, I can appreciate inflation. Uh, twenty thirty, you go twenty five thirty five. That's fine. You raise it that high. You can't sell booze in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. I'm going to take it all for free and put you in jail. And he goes twenty five and thirty five is fine, my friend. I'm like motherfucker. Couldn't we just done this in the first place? <laughs> so, so we're um, we're in the we're at the safe house, and um, we were actually technically a ranger major was in charge of us. We did have a um, senior enlisted guys with us, but the ranger major was kind of running it between. Jalalabad airfield and our safe house and he came out and we're, so we're drinking Heineken in this uh, tub and he said hey uh, your boys just got fucked up we gotta go oh shit and we're like whoa what do you, what do you mean he goes yeah they just shot a helo down and we, we gotta we gotta we gotta go that and was your first deployment over there yeah first one how long were you in country oh, before shit. that I, I was almost done so three and a half months and that was this is June and um, we we rolled over I ran into a few guys I knew from uh uh, from SEAL Team 2 that, that put me through training master chiefs that were there and uh, you know and, and uh, the other helicopter that got that missed and I don't know if it was 3-4 or 3-2 uh, got missed the pilots landed in the wrong spot on the on the, uh, the, the a different base on in Jalalabad because they were something happened so other guys were coming in that didn't get shot down and I remember they said yeah it just it just came out of the valley and turned and it it, it hit and it went down. At three three went down, and and it, one of them missed us. Damn. So we're talking to guys that just got shot at by surface to air missiles, even though technically that's not what happened. They're telling me face to face missiles were coming out of that valley. And it was so it was more of a holy shit. The, 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 I mean, it's good to see you because the, the world's still a decent place because you're still alive or whatever the fuck we're saying. And they they came out and said, look, um, we need to, there's a crash site. We got to get up there, and they're not going to fly us because they're shooting down helicopters now. So figure it out. And we're running around this makeshift airfield, and I'll, I'll, there's a there's like a bee hut full of rangers, and we're like, hey, we we here's the situation, and we told them, and we're like, um, I need five guys, and uh, all twenty of them jumped up and said, we should you know we should take us ten minutes to get ready, we'll be out in three, and then they came out, the we decided to go get whatever vehicle you can, steal shit, commandeer it, we're driving as far as we can, and then we're humping up into the um, into the valley, and um, we, you know, we we didn't know we didn't know if there were survivors. We didn't know what happened, but we knew Taliban was up there, and so we um, we drove drove as far as we could, and then we started walking um, up up. And this is daytime. It's I don't know ninety to hundred degrees Fahrenheit humidity, and we're humping up to. I mean, 
to the point where there were dudes like I carry too many mags um, because it's so. You're, there were dudes passing shit back to like like who's taking it? Just drop it if it's yeah. too. So keep water. Maybe we can get an airlift or, or something. And and then we you know we humped up for um, for ten hours. So we're not quite there yet. And uh, I remember looking around and saying, hey, did any of you guys call home before we left on this thing? And they're like, no, why? And it's like, well, all our families know is a bunch of SEALs from Virginia just got killed and they haven't heard from us. And so that's going through your mind too. We're, we're sticking each other with IVs, hanging them in trees and stuff. And I remember looking at a guy th- saying, uh, you know, this is why training is so hard. Because if we were going to quit right now, where the fuck are we going to go? We're yeah. here. So we, we kept going up. They did fly in... Um, they did fly in a helicopter from Bogham, more of Red Squadron. They got to the crash site first. So they, I mean, I don't know who wants that job, but they got the job and they're going to go to the crash site and find, find it. And, um, you know, some of the stories that I've heard were like Lou Langless was looking at the crash site and he said, I'm going to go um, um, try to get some intel from the village. And he looked over and said, I, I just never want to die like that. You know, and Lou was on Extortion 1-7. Damn. And these are just hearsay stories about, you know, it's life is fragile, man. And uh, um, so we started humping back down. We're trying to leave this. The sun's going down. And then we, we spotted some um, some Taliban on the opposite ridge line. And, you know, we're like, fuck it. Let's call in. Who wants to hit them? And the cloud cover was coming in and nobody nobody wanted to to um, uh, to, to get under it. You know, because fucking you're in the Western Himalayas, man. This is Hindu Kush shit. But the A-10s would. And that's the first time I've seen an A-10 get called in. And it just, it was so low and and um, it came over us. And the, the, an A-10 obviously shoots, what is it? How many rounds? 3,000 rounds a minute or something it's crazy? Some, some crazy. I, I don't know. Someone's going to correct me, but that's a lot. It's so much, it sounds like a growl. And when it, when it came over us, the first thing we heard was the bullets going supersonic. Then we heard it. No, so we saw the smoke, heard them supersonic, heard them hit, then we heard it shoot. So it's... Uh, uh, and that, like that's when he, <laughs> there was a marine. I'm I'm I know people have heard this, seen the meme, but I'm pretty sure it was coined that day. There was a, like a marine or a young private in the army that said, "It is true what they say. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger." Except an A10. An A10 will fucking kill you. <laughs> <It's> awesome. <laughs> oh shit. So to, well then well then we we walk down and um, we're closer to Asadabad than we are, and we it, shit it had been maybe two days. And we're closer to Asadabad than we are to Jalalabad. So we're going to go to Abad um, and we're going to rack out there. They've got beds um, or a floor. I don't give a shit. We've been awake for so long. And that's when the dude that got the note from Marcus, um, he showed up. So he's got this. You were there when that yeah, guy showed when, up? when the guy showed up. And because we had an argument with the, um, you know, I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers here, but we had an argument with the agency because they don't, they never want to burn a source, which is fine. That's a thing, gathering intel. But this guy knows where Marcus is, and you're taking us there right now. And and I don't give a shit if they kill you. What's it worth thinking? Their agency's yelling, and they something along the lines of, "Well, we're not sure if this is him because he didn't cross the T's in his name, Latrell." And we're like, "Yeah, but it's on TAC notes, and he got his fucking social right. It's yeah. him. We're going." So there was a big argument there. I'm pretty sure I know a guy got fired for that. Um, one of the Rangers got fired. I think banned from the country, but he made the call. You're, we're gonna go. So then we got back in the car. We drove around the Pesh River Valley. Um, you're going around Abad up to Pesh, which now you're in, in no man's land. And, um, and Marcus, I guess, had gone from the Korangal into the Shuriak Valley, which are two. I mean, these are two neighboring valleys, and pe- people don't understand in Afghanistan. There have been families living in these valleys for 10,000 years that have never met. Yeah. Like, they don't, you don't, you're, you're not allowed in. And hate each other. Hate, yeah. They'll cut your head off. And, like, put, like, old school Dracula, put it on a stake type shit. So we're driving in there, and this is a part where I've seen. Afghanistan's a different world, and people don't understand that. If they, if they've, when I first got to Red Team, I was asking guys, "What's Afghanistan like?" They said, "You just have to see it because you're not going to believe me." Yeah. And so we we went up there, and it's they, like they don't have water. And I remember seeing like the, there's kid. I'm a father, and I'm seeing these kids. I remember handing a bottle of water to a little girl. She opened it, dumped it out, so she could play with the plastic. So then we're pumping up again. Um, Another mountain, and it's just steep terrain, and, and then we ha- we knew he was up and over. Marcus is down in this village, and, and we got up um, almost to the top, and one of my guys said, um, one of my guys said, um, I got to sit down. I can't, I can't, I can't go anymore. 
we've been awake for three, three and a half days. I can't go. And I said, that's okay. We'll just tell Mrs. Luttrell, Marcus's mom, that we didn't, we were this close, but we didn't get him because you got tired. And he goes, yeah, you're right. And I said, do me, a, I said, do me a favor. Tell that shit to me in one minute because I don't think I can go any further. And so we're just whatever, trying to get up to the top. And that's, you know, Rangers came in, Helos. They did get Marcus out. And then um, now we're just in the Shuriak Valley. It's like, all right, well, let's try to live our way out of this one. And so wait, you weren't with the Rangers? It was just four of you guys? No, 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 no. We, we were with Rangers. And we okay. were with, and there were Marines and shit there. To, uh, I'll never forget seeing Marines because, like, we got to choose what we would wear. I had a, I'd had no body armor, a couple mags, and a sh- uh, shirt. And they're wearing full, like, first sergeant told me I need to wear all this shit. I'm a, like I said at the beginning, Marines are fucking bad motherfuckers. They will, they will take shitty gear and make it suck even more. <laughs> <laughs> Semper Fi, baby. But, yeah, the Rangers flew in. And, and, and that was ballsy, too, because one of our options was... Um, I mean, we, we, well, I, let me back up. When, when we had that dude, uh, Afghanistan might as well be the 13th century. We showed this guy an aerial photo of his village on an iPad. I might as well have just showed him an actual picture of Allah. This dude looking at an iPad, like <laughs> one minute you're fucking your animal. Now you're looking at an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> So we were gonna fly in. He could couldn't really pick it up, but we they, uh, we we thought this could be a mud suck. We're just gonna walk. But Rangers, fucking being Rangers, man, they, we'll do it, and they did, and they got him. And then we lived our way out, and then the you know the remaining two or three weeks is a miserable deployment. We lost so many great guys on that on that heel. Yeah, and then yeah. That, so that's deployment number one. Damn, dude. Yeah, that's a. It was intense. I mean, because we, I mean, at, fr- at first we were just having fun and it wasn't real. I mean, it was real, but like the fighting's over. Army, the Green Berets and CIA took care of that shit. They bombed the fuck out of them. We're, we're just, we're going to rebuild or something. And then Delta's going to find Bin Laden. We're just going to do this. The food was great. Yeah. What? So what were you guys doing before that? We, uh, we were just testing new technology, trying to find, um, we found a few minor Al Qaeda guys in town. <clears throat> we, we, we actually, there's a video online where we, fa- we we put these, um, there was an Al-Qaeda guy working at a gas station. He was laundering money and funding shit because that's one of the major ways. There's only a few roads, obviously. And um, we, the RRD Rangers, the, the, uh, and they're awesome dudes. Um, they went out on an on RNS and they really watched this damn gas station in it for five days, which just sucks, like in the heat. And then we, they you know they, they had eyes on whatever they, and we rolled from the safe house 30 seconds, grabbed this dude, and then rolled out with him. There's a video that they made of us rolling up. We wear this ridiculous Haji gear. Uh, I, I mean, I don't blend in. I don't know if you know. You don't blend in? No, man. If we go to war with Scotland, I'm, I'm in there. <laughs> but um, we, you know, we roll up. We run in. We run out. We got this dude in the van. Takes away. They, they made a video. If you, if you can find it online, it says uh, a snatch and grab at the grab and go. <laughs> and it's literally a 30-second mission. And that, that was, uh, we just rolled him out through him, through him to Bagram. But we were just, we were using technology to track Al-Qaeda and see what they're doing. And, and mainly, I mean, we're just rolling them up to get intel. We're trying to to build the network to find... There's not a lot of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan at this point. They all went to uh, Pakistan. Okay. So not a lot. I mean, a couple dudes in, up in the Korangal. Uh, but most of them went over to the uh, federally administrative tribal area, the Fada. And they're mm-hmm. all over there on that side. And all that's right. another story that I have uh, two deployments later. Let's go into it. Okay. Well, I mean, we did go to Iraq next. We'll go. We'll we'll jump to this, and then we'll go to Iraq. Okay. Um, so, my uh, next deployment to Afghanistan, I was uh, instead of being a member at the JBAD Safe House, I was in charge of the Asadabad Safe House. So I'm the team leader there, which means I have one other guy um, with me from from Red Team, uh, and then we have a few augments that are that are probably going to screen for Dev Group. Uh, but aren't there yet, so they come over to learn how, what we're doing, and then and we're working with the agency, uh, running sources back and forth, and mainly this is just for drone strikes, so we can get intel, hit these guys or whatever. And uh, we we were getting bored, and a very important lesson I learned on this deployment is never die because you got bored. Do everything like you do anything, and always follow your rules. People die because they take shortcuts or they get bored. I got bored, and uh, I came up with a plan with this the chief of, of base who was a he had actually been with the agency fighting 
um, with the Mujahideen against the Russians. So this dude knew the area. And so he and I, over, over cocktails, I think the agency calls it fellowship. Over fellowship, we came up with a plan that we know, as per rules of engagement, uh, if we have troops in contact and positive identification on the border, we can pursue, I want to say, 10 clicks inside of Pakistan. So we knew there was a, um, about a click in and a click and a half in. There were two Al-Qaeda safe houses. So we figured if we go up there on the border and sort of show ourselves, they'll shoot at us. We'll call air support. We can hit these houses. That's going to be a good mission. Cross border off. This is badass. So that's the plan. And everything went to shit because we get up there. Uh, I got a, a couple, um, a couple army guys, and then a few Afghans. And we had actually, we had put on um, the brown tiger stripe stuff. And I don't even know if that's legal. So we don't look like Americans. So. We're trying to, if the if the if Al Qaeda or the Taliban sees us, they're not worried about air support because this is simply, you know, A and A, Afghan army. Yeah, we'll kill them. We didn't we didn't put that together because that like a truck came up and some dudes got out and it's like a, it's like I'm almost like a flash checkpoint, and they walk up and they're yelling f- us to come talk to them for tea, and I was like, yeah, well, you guys go talk to him. Don't don't tell him there's Americans here, whatever. So they went down there and they kind of came back and they said, yeah, they want a tea, but we're not falling for that. So they went to this thing. And we're, we got the high ground here. It's it's 1130 in the morning. We, we, we stayed overnight. We're up there. It's 1130 in the morning. And then another truck came up full of guys. And then another truck came up full of guys. And then another one. Now we have a little bit of high ground, but there's a lot of dudes down there. And this is some serious fucking ambush shit. I'm in charge. I'm, I'm, I'm you know. An E6 or E7, but I'm the ground force commander of this one. It's my call. It's like, well, I mean, we can get the fuck out of here right now. They they want they might not notice. So I'm like, yeah, you know, we're gonna beat it. So uh, we had some guys below us, a, a semi mortar team that, but they, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. They weren't U.S. Army. Uh, we didn't know if they could do it. So we're running down to them. I'm explaining what's happening, and we're, we got to haul ass, or maybe we can we can get uh, exfil. And that's when uh, one of the Afghan guys I was with said the, the first words I ever heard him speak in English, he pointed up and yelled, bad guys. And I remember looking up, and uh, now this is going to be a real gunfight in the mountains at high noon. And watching dudes run that fast, and in, in, they had brown, brown, sh- like brown uniforms almost on. So these are, these are it's a, it turns out to be a mix of... Uh, Al Qaeda, Taliban, and PACMIL, Pakistan military. No shit. And, and, and we're looking up, and they're they're surrounding us, and they're hauling ass, and they they just start zipping ring rounds at us, and you can you can hear them, you know, zip zip zip. And the scariest ones were the, the ricochets, zip zing. So we're like we're like we we can't move now. We're pinned. Then they got us on like three sides. Um, we had separated. I had a new guy. It wasn't he was a he was uh, a SEAL Team Four. Uh, he he had he was my radio guy. He had never ever called in real world close air support, and I need him now. And he's uh, he's may, uh, maybe a hundred yards away. Uh, um, I had heard up to this point some of our standard operating procedures that originated from Vietnam were lines of gear. How you wear your gear in lines: first line, second line, third line. Your first line gear is your most important shit. It's closest to your body. It's on your belt. It's 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 um, an you know an extra mag in a pocket in Copenhagen, whatever, uh, a, a cash. Second line gear is your second most important stuff. Magazines, grenades, maybe some more water, and your third line gear is your least important stuff in your rucksack. So that's your sleeping bag and ground pad, extra socks, foot powder. The reason, so I'd been told, you keep it that way is because if you need to run. You can start ditching your shit in order to get lighter. Now, that's the first time I've ever, ever heard anyone doing it. I drop my ruck. I sprint over to Tony. I got to get to him because, you know, and the people are just eating dirt. I, I lay next to him. And uh, um, I said, okay, here's the deal. That we're Up on the thing where they set the flash checkpoint, um, hit that first. And he said, I can't. We don't have any air support. I'm like, okay, this is bad. Get you got to get some, whatever it takes. Just, you know, we'd been up there for a day and a half. We, they'd lost interest in whatever, and, and the p- other people, whatever. So we're laying there, and I'm just right next to him. And and um, the rounds are getting so close that 
they were hitting air bursts above us with RPGs where explosion, and they're shooting mortars at us too, um, that you'd hear an explosion and look back to, are my legs still there? Shit. And no, I mean, nothing was hit and I don't know how, I don't know how. There, it got so bad. Um, we, we, did, we did this for an hour where it, it's not even, there, the worst feeling I've ever had in the world is having someone shoot effective fire at me, but realizing I can't shoot back because my rounds probably won't reach him. And I, if I lift my head up, I'm done. Like we were seeing tracers. Uh, right between us, and um, how many of you guys were there? Um, a total of six, five or six Americans. That's it. Maybe fifteen Afghans. How, how about the opposed? The oh, I, I don't know. I th there was a lot. There was three or four truckloads full of them. Shit. And um, and so so we're up there. This is all happening, and they they now they were to the point they were so close that I had a dude shooting at me. Um, he looked like me. I had a red beard, a white guy, shooting a PKM, but he's yelling, Allahu Akbar, God is great, in Arabic. So now I'm seeing this shit. And again, we don't have, I don't even have night vision because I don't need it. It's daytime. It's in my, whatever. And um, that's when you start to think, okay, not only is that Al-Qaeda, that's a Chechen. This is where you save at least one bullet for yourself. Yeah. I'm not, the, those guys will skin you alive. And we and 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 uh, this is all happening. And finally, Tony said, uh, "All right, I got one. I got one." I said, "Awesome! Hit that fucking checkpoint. Get it in here now." And he said, "Okay, I can't. the The batteries in my radio just died because we had been out there and it had been on, and they just they died." And so, one of my jokes about this is, um, um, I don't believe in micromanaging. You used to teach your people how to do it and let them do it. But right now, I figured it was a proper time to micromanage. I said, "Change the fucking batteries." And he said, I can't. I'm not carrying the spares. Remember, you are. They're in the rucksack that oh, I dropped. Shit. Yep. So I said something. I mean, I don't have a choice at this point. I said something along the lines of, don't tell mom I did this. And I ran. So I'm running to that thing. And I don't know. I don't know. It's, I'm saying 100 yards. And I don't know how I hadn't been hit at this point. And naturally, I know where they're packed. They're probably at the bottom of this fucking thing. I'm open to this damn thing. I grabbed... The two old school batteries. Now I'm running back. Fuck the rucksack. I have the batteries and I I chucked them to him. And now we're calling in air support. And uh, th there was a funny story, something. Uh, okay, no, what what he said was uh, bombs away two minutes out. And I'm like, two minutes? What did he fucking drop this from the space shuttle? Was that the first... <laughs> Nothing takes two minutes to fall anywhere. Well, it turns out it was, I think it was a, it was Bones. It was a B1. And he was at 60,000 feet. And he just dropped three JDAMs, uh, three 2,000 pounders. Shit. And it's danger close, but like, whatever. And uh, uh, one of the guys said to me, uh, this is danger close. What do we, what do we do if it hits us? And I said, not a problem. Plug your ears. <laughs> and then uh, they don't, they, they don't, they don't whistle, they sizzle. It sounded like bacon. Zzz. And then we lit, the whole hillside lit up. And like, I'm watching dudes on fire running around that we just hit with, with that's, the, that's the first time I was like, I will never make another joke about the Air Force. That is a, thank you. I heard, that was America. Just that, and now, and now they're running. Al Qaeda is, and I'm now I'm finally getting some shots off. I think I killed the Chechen. They're running up the hill, we're fucking lighting them up. Um, uh, and it, it turned the tide there. And then we called them in again. It actually got to the point where we bombed Pakistan for four hours. One of the guys we called in, his call sign was Dude One Two, which I thought was just awesome. And he was, you know, and now we're calling in where he's flying upside down and he's he's like wanting us to describe what we see. And it's like, you know, can you see the the peak with the snow, yes. Can you see the, the intersection of the river? Yes. That's one unit of measure. I want you to take two of those units, please, at 097 magnetic, all this bullshit. But like the first thing that the conversation that I had with him was so awesome. He because you know we had adrenaline going. He wants you to calm down. So he said, just talk to me like I'm a man. And I said, I see why women find you attractive. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we so we get done with that. And we can find, and then at this point, you know, we got more fast movers. The Kiowas showed up, and they're just bad motherfuckers. And then we can call in to um, uh, a couple 60s. We got some army pilots come. They're going to pick us up. We're going we're gonna to bounce. Uh, so I, I, they, they called us in. I, I got on the starboard side, the right side of this 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 uh, this Blackhawk, and we're now we're leaving. And um, it's it's a it's a 
maybe a 10 minute flight back to Abe. That's how close we were to this right on the border. And uh, that's the first time I saw the, um, the battlefield that we just created and it is scorched earth. And I'm thinking, oh man, we just bombed Pakistan. That is an international incident. Yeah. Then I thought, I'm in charge. I'm probably going to hear about this. Oh, shit. And I was right, because we landed at ABAD, and they uh, had already flown a, uh, a two-star general in there to meet with us. And, and he said, uh, I, and I'm in a good mood at this point. I, I was going to die for the past six hours. Now I'm going to live, and I'm in a good mood. And he said, uh, hey, O'Neill, you realize we're not at war with Pakistan, right? And I said, yeah, man, but we were today, and you should have fucking... S- <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and then he, and they, he said, yeah, there's going to be an investigation, obviously, and... Uh, you're either going to get a silver star or you're going to spend the rest of your life in Leavenworth. Shit. And you think waiting an hour for a bomb is a long time. Try waiting three weeks for that decision to be made. We got lucky, though. And, and the, the footage is still on, on, on the internet where Pakistan was saying it was an unprovoked attack by American forces like they always do because it turns out Pakistan fucking lies to us. Um, they had the footage as they're getting the stuff. They go, okay, well, really, now look at this. Here's your guys attacking my guys. And they, they said there were something like a 21 martyrs from the pack. We killed like 21 Pakistanis that were fighting us. Wow. So that's like a... So I did get a Silver Star. That you did? Yeah, yeah. That was my first Silver Star. What's actually funny is I'd been, I'd been lying to my mom my entire career because it's easier to go to war than to send someone you love to war. So, But their worrying is not going to affect how you do. So don't make them worry. Just lie to them. Oh, we're not doing shit. Don't worry, Mom. Iraq's not what you think. We're not... Whatever. My mother came down to... Um, to Virginia Beach for my the presentation of the Silver Star, and they actually read the unclassified version of what happened, and she's sitting there listening. And I remember saying, "Mom, I promise you, I'll never get another Silver Star." <laughs> now, fast forwarding to the day after the Bin Laden raid, I said, "Mom, I, I think I lied to you. I think I'm getting a second Silver Star." <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Damn, dude. That's cra- crazy, and that was just because. Um, Another rule in life, you don't need to go looking for it. Don't go looking for it. Yeah. If, if it's meant to find you, it'll just find you. Don't, like, uh, well, like, thanks to jujitsu. Don't find anyone in a bar. You don't know who's a black belt. Very true. Yeah, don't go looking for it. If, if you get in a bar fight and someone starts with a leg kick, apologize and buy him a drink. <laughs> no, my bad. I was wrong. <laughs> Exhales through the nose. Damn. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's take a quick break, yeah. and then when we come back, we'll talk about, we'll get into Iraq. Cool. All right, so we're back from the break. Let's talk about Iraq. Iraq again was one of those things where um, I, I hadn't been, and I and, and I knew it was it was it was more dangerous than Afghanistan at the time, because foreign fighters had realized it'll be easier to kill Americans in Iraq because we can get there a lot easier than to go to Afghanistan, and um, and they and they they had learned our tactics. They they knew what we were doing. They, they knew that one of our tactics was um, if, it, if there's an open door, we're going to run into it because a lot of this stupid, um, not stupid, but just arrogant special forces, um, not special forces, all of us, were, there, there's going to be a fight anyway, let's just get it over with. That was the mentality at the time. Al-Qaeda knew that. So leave the door open, have machine gunners inside, and then just drill the first four guys in the room. They, they did that. Um, and so we went over there. Um, our, our, our army counterparts took some pretty heavy casualties, and, and that's when we kind of... Um, started to learn that the, one of the worst things you can say, and it's nothing on them. Th- those guys are complete studs. 
Um, but one of the worst things you can say when you're running a team is, well, this is the way we've always done it. It's like, wait a minute, why are we running into, why are we running in there? How about we just, how about we stop? Why don't we just clear the room from the door? We, in, we invented combat clearance. We, we, why are we sprinting at night through houses with white lights when we can put our nods down and own it? And, and why are we yelling? Stop yelling. When you turn a corner and you point your gun up, I don't need to hear you yell, stairwell. I'll assume there's a stairwell. Shut the fuck up. Quiet. So we started training on um, um, silent runs. And we learned when we were silent, not only were we were faster and more efficient, we were communicating at the highest levels simply by reading off each other. Don't you know, there's no reason to um, to give someone your position and And then we so we just started reinventing tactics not just we at Red Squadron or SEAL Team 6 Delta was on board with all this stuff and we're all and what we were really good about too I mean, I mentioned a, a cross um, uh, a Rivalry type thing between services That wasn't us or Delta we we would cross train with each other and then most importantly the guys that just got back would debrief the guys about to go over. And we would take them on, um, even when we got, like when we're leaving our, our relief squadron, we would take them on a shakeout op. Like, here's what we're doing, here's how it works. Everything from intel uh, to workout schedules to here's what you should do, and here's the dangerous part, here's the, what we're looking for. And we, you know, we did a lot of that stuff. And, and um, it was everything from uh, snipers realizing that they're, they're climbing the roof. So they, um, okay, I don't, I mean, I'm not saying I agree with this in Iraq, but I don't need body armor. I need to be light. I don't need this many magazines. I haven't shot that much. Um, and, but again, too, be careful what you wish for. I, we had I had a sniper of mine that I was telling him because he's climbing every, he's climbing every building and he's you know he's the first one out there leading the patrol and we're doing you know we realize that you don't need to land on the X, land over here. We'll walk in and when they figure that out, we'll, we'll take motorbikes in and then we'll walk in. Um, I had one sniper that I was saying um, we had an argument at six. I was a sniper at two. But then I, I said, I, you can be a, an assaulter or a sniper at SEAL Team 6. And I said, I, I want to be an assaulter. My joke was, and again, joking, but not seeing the future. I said, I know snipers are going to kill more people, but I think assaulters are going to kill more famous people. You, you said that? Yeah. <laughs> it's a joke. It's like the thing with my mom. We're not doing anything. Snipers will kill more people. Assaulters will kill more famous people. Damn, talk about so, throwing some shit out into the universe. I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so we had my, this one sniper, and he, he got to the point, I think, where he was carrying one mag, a 5.56. He, he loved the 5.56 with the 14-inch with the uh, the, the chopper. And then one mag in a, in a harness and, like, no water. Like, that's his loadout. That's it. And I'm like, dude... I know we're, we're I, I know our plan is to only be here during one cycle of darkness, but you're gonna eventually you're gonna want more bullets than that. And I I think our last gunfight on that trip to uh, to Iraq, he, he was in a, we were in a weird gunfight, and his snipes were up top, and he, he was blasting out. And he my nickname was Nizro, Navy Seal Rob O'Neill, Nizro. That's what my friends at the bar could yell, "What up, my Nizro?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and he yelled out, he goes, Nizro. I need a mag. And I said, no, dude, I told you to carry more bullets. And he literally goes, come on, I can still hear him screaming. <laughs> but um, but we, were, we were learning stuff like that. We learned you don't need to rush through. The, um, um, the first kill that I ever got was in, on that Iraq deployment. And it's when we just decided, because um, we were still in between the nods up and, or even look under them, white light fast. We said, we're going to go slow. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go in quiet. We're not going to blow the door. We're going to pick the lock. We figured out ways to break the glass quietly and open it and just go inside. Wake them up. You know, catch them when they're sleeping. See how many guys you can touch while they're sleeping. We'll, we'll, we started having competitions. How many Al-Qaeda guys can you check for a suicide bomb and then wake them up by saying, shh, and then watching a grown man shit his pants. That was one of the greatest things ever. But one of the nights we were going into this thing, we had a, we had a lane, uh, a hallway, and like the first time we're trying this quiet, and we're walking in. This Al-Qaeda dude hops out. He's got an AK-47. He could have killed every single one of us. But he couldn't see us. So we hop back in the room. And now we, okay, there's shit. We had a guy with us, Andy, who is a special boat service guy at SBS. And Brits are the fucking best. They're, they're as funny, or if not funnier than we are. But I compare them like we're the normal keys. They're the sharp keys on a mm -hmm. piano. Like it sounds good, but it's, it's a little <laughs> off. Um, he had a cloud of death over him. The other Brits said, you're going with Andy. He, he gets in fights. Like he just, it follows him. You will get, I'm like, 
you're going to get in a fight. And so Andy happened to be with us. And then our, one of our guys goes through, we clear the room. And one of our guys, his first kill, blasts this guy, splits him wide open. And then we're kind of looking over there. And Andy, who's been in fights since the invasion, we're like, Andy, can you go check that guy? And he, he walks over with a white light and goes, oh, he's fuck mate. <laughs> so at, at this point now that they heard us shoot inside, um, we got the D-boys hitting another target. Our snipers are going hot. So uh, myself and, and one of my guys were like, well, let's, we got to get out and, and get into this. this. These are our first kills. This actually turned out to be the sniper who initiated the fire to rescue Captain Phillips from Smalley Pirates. We got our first kills together. We went outside and we did this cross pan that we'd always been working on. Like if, if you're on this side, you cover this way, he covers this way. And then you wave and move or whatever. So we're out here. These two dudes pop up like pepper poppers. Like, bow, 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 bow. So we get our first two kills and I'm like, shit, I just killed that guy. And he goes, yeah, I just killed that guy. I go, okay, what do we do now? And he goes, maybe we should try one of those bounding things. <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of sinks in. And then that's, that's another, you know, we finished that off. We the, killed a bunch of dudes. We got, that was our first major fight in Iraq where the tactics we're using worked, but how did they adjust to us? How do we readjust? We might need to readjust to this. And, and uh, that was another thing where um, now SEAL Team 6 was getting in fights and getting kills. And it was just sort of a, okay, now... And this is before the Afghanistan huge fights. And okay, now, now I have my first kill. Now I'm, I'm part of the club. And this is it. I'm in. And then, you know, we, we finish Iraq and we learn stuff. And then we go back and we train. And then we keep talking to the other guys that are over there. Learn new tactics. What's working? What's not working? Do you like which barrel? Which magnifier are you using with your optics? Um, um, we had to tell some army guys, like, look, that, that, that laser, this thing, that pistol grip and all this is great in Iraq. When you get to 10,000 feet, in Afghanistan, you're not going to want that because weight is measured in ounces and ounces equal pounds, and it's going to suck. What do you need? You need you need an EOTech and an iron sight. You're good. That's it. Um, so yeah, so that was Iraq. So we bounced from Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. We I was um, I was part. My fourth deployment was we called it the deployment that never was because we had um, th so the commander of SEAL Team Six just got us authorized. For some reason, we were not authorized to fight the Taliban in Afghanistan. We were supposed to go only after Al Qaeda. Really? Yeah, it was weird. Uh, it was, you know, and it's, it's, I mean, it makes sense, sort of. You want to just send the tier one guys after the tier one targets, but, you know, we're getting bored and there's a lot of fighting in Kandahar. So that, so they authorized C T Team Six to start targeting Taliban. That's when Blue Team went in there and just fucking crushed them. Got in fights like epic shit that you can, I mean, there's books out there, Mob Six, by chef that's fucking amazing. I and mean, he's just a fucking stud. And um, just and so our group went, they wanted to all go to Afghanistan to include the headset. So the bosses, the CEO of the whole team, and they're all there. And they sent like a troop of us, 15 dudes to Iraq. And our boss, his name is Rich Davini, and I can say that because he's made himself a public stud too. He was a guy that taught me nobody ever worked for me, they work with me. And he agreed to work for Delta. Like a lot of arrogant team guys wouldn't want to work for them. But he's like, you know what? If we're going to get work, it's going to be for them. Because like it or not, the Army runs the show. So we started working for Delta. And it happened to be during the surge, the awakening, when, when um, Stan McChrystal, General, excuse me, McChrystal realized if we start killing Al-Qaeda, which are Sunnis that are hijacking Sunnis, we can get them to rise up and help us. And we can win this war. And, and they did. Guys like um, uh, Stan McChrystal, Bill McRaven, they were on the right track. And they were, you know, I would follow those guys to hell. But we started hitting those targets on basically kill missions uh, every night. And we were to a point where if, if we only killed 11 dudes, it was a waste of our time. No shit. Yeah, it was insane. We're, we're targeting uh, Al-Qaeda in places where they've never seen guys like us. Um, like, even we learned how to interrogate people. Like, you get a cocky Al-Qaeda guy. It's like, I've seen Americans before. And you say, really, do they look like me? And they kind of look at your tattoos. I had a demon hunter patch, a beard. Like, I'm not here by accident, my friend. I'm here for you. Like, just fucking awesome shit. Psychological warfare. And we called it the deployment that never was because everyone's in Afghanistan from, from our crew. And they're fighting. And they don't give a shit about us. So as long as we keep doing this, um, it's on. And that was, I mean, I think the Iraq war was completely fucked up. But that was one of the best summers of my life. Because at the time, um, we were warriors. And that's what we're here. We're here to kill you. Yeah, and we fucked them up. We we I, I, we didn't have one of our guys hurt. We I don't know how many kills we got, but it was guys like Rich that were running the team. Like like we would hit a target, and because of the intel on target, the battlefield interrogation, we would hit a follow on target. So it's like 
And so we would go up with Rangers, and uh, I love working with them because, you know, you got, they're obviously capable of doing all this, but they generally would put like a machine gunner and they're kind of blocking as we hit the point target. Once you hear the Rangers going hot, and you know, Rangers know like two things ruck hump and fucking kill it. So they're just awesome guys. Obviously, they're better than that. I'm just, I'm, I love Rangers. Um, but once you hear them outside, like you hear the 240 going hot, doo, 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 doo. it's like, okay, it's, it's a fight. So we would go from house to house. And we're, I'm talking, we're getting, we're getting kills in, in every, every room. Um, and we're, we're doing a, a quick, um, like a, a quick brief to the boss. Like, okay, here, we got to hit this building right here. And I think, you know, I'm talking too fast. I talk fast. It is. And I look at Rich and said, all right, you know what, sir? I'm sorry. You're in charge. And he looked at me and said, oh, make no mistake. I'm not in charge. I'm responsible. <laughs> and that's a great fucking leader right there. Yeah. And so we would do that. We had, we had missions where, um, uh, so you were, hold on. So you were just. You would go hit a house, you would do an interrogation, and then immediately from there, it, it, do depending a on what we found. But we generally found, we generally found the guy we we're looking for in the first house, or someone that knew who was. We there was Jesus. There was one guy, and you've been to Iraq. It's a fucked up place too. We were going after a guy called uh, like Mullah Muhammad One Arm, because he's a mullah and he's got one arm. <laughs> <laughs> we grabbed a mullah, pulled him back. His name was Mullah Muhammad. One arm, but he was missing the wrong arm. There was another one. We grabbed the wrong guy. Holy yeah. shit. Um, but we would do stuff like, uh, um, the way that it worked for us is we, we started in Al-Assad out west, and we were hitting targets up into Syria. And then we cleared it to, you know, we got into Fallujah, got into Ramadi, got into Baghdad, north of Baghdad. And it's not just us, but we're working with the Army, with the Air Force, with the Marines, and, and we're getting shit done, and we're really winning this war. And uh, like there were times too. I, what I love about special operators is they really know how to solve problems. They came to us with um, there was a problem um, north of Baghdad. I think it was called Bakuba, whatever. And it, but it was a peninsula, and it was a small peninsula. And but there, it hadn't been touched since the invasion in '03. So this is 2007. This place hasn't been touched because. There's uh, 19 Al Qaeda guys there, and they're IED makers. They're improvised explosive device makers. We haven't gotten to them because there's one road in. Yeah. No one wants to drive that road. They're going to blow you up. We're not going to carpet bomb them because there are so many innocent civilians there. And I mean, you do have certain collateral damage, but we're not going to kill that many innocent people. Plus, they're getting bullied by Al Qaeda, tortured. Like, we can't fast rope. They're going to shoot us down. So they came to us and they said, uh, can you guys solve this problem? And, and being Navy SEALs, we're like, well, yeah, it's going to suck, uh, but we can swim in. And it's not a swim like a Bud's Ocean Swim. It's like a swampy, shitty, nasty, whatever. And, you know, there's water in Iraq, and people don't realize that. But we did, and we went in with um, 17 SEALs and two dogs, two Malinois. And they're important to the story because we got in there, immediately, immediate gunfight, but we cleared... 10 houses, we killed all 19 guys, didn't hurt one woman or child, and then we left. Swam out. Uh, the next day, the locals woke up, and you know, they're, they're the usual terror reigned by these Al Qaeda fucks, but now there's no one, they're dead, they're gone. And they had a block party. So we have assets above, and they're watching, because you want to see who, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to give away tactics, but you want to see what happens after yep. for follow on. And there's this block party going on. The block party got so big. Um, a reporter from Baghdad, when a newspaper reporter from Baghdad went up there and interviewed the people in the houses that we had taken down and asked who came last night. And the headline on the newspaper said they were ninjas and they came with lions. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, fucking lions. How cool is that? That's pretty badass. Yeah. So, but that's what we did for that. We um, we got, I mean, I mean, watching, I was, you know, just proud of my guys. That's when I realized that that right now, and this is probably me just being arrogant. Right now, Red Team is the fighting, finest fighting force in the world. There, there's no one that does I mean, obviously, there are guys that do it like that, but I'm here, I see it now, this is my bubble. These, but I fucking love these guys. Yeah. And I think that was the most combat that, that, that we'd ever seen, and that was that 2007 deployment to Iraq. Damn, how long are the deployments over there? Four months? Yeah. And you guys were just hitting it every, every night. night? Yep. Son of a bitch. Can you, can we, you... we were in places where... Uh, we put up makeshift tents to sleep, like not not like, but I mean, it's not secure. Like there's a there's concertina wire maybe and some Iraqi guards. Like you're you could be in it every, you know. But then like no internet, no TVs. 
uh, the chow hall is a mile and a half away or whatever. And, and uh, there's so nothing to do. Like I remember guys singing. I learned the Cincinnati Bengals fight song because I was sleeping in between two dudes from Cincinnati. <laughs> Still know it. Let's go into a little more detail. So you swam in. Yeah, which I mean, it was, I wouldn't. It's not so much even a swim. It's just a really shitty swamp where you're grabbing the dogs by the by their um, their handles and just inserting to, like you get under palm groves and the the big grapes with the huge rats running across it. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, the closer you get to target, the dogs are barking. They know you're coming, and then you get through. The snipers start climbing, and then uh, once the snipers get up there, and you just you hear them go hot. Um, it's just on. But I mean, it was we were we were good at it. So we're we're moving quickly through houses um i mean not too but like we, we were killing dudes in, in in houses clearing one man in blast him and then move down the thing and you're killing other dudes um and at the time it's cool yeah you know the further you get away from from that it's you know you start wondering what you're doing yeah Do you th does that bother you yeah oh yeah yeah there there are certain guys i think about uh there's there's one guy in particular that i think about that i killed uh, he was the second guy I killed in this house. I entered the house, killed the guy in the front. I went into a bedroom. I did a one-man entry because I'm an idiot. And uh, there was a guy that was um, in bed with his wife. And he, he, I gave him the courtesy of calm down. You know, you're waking up. Just, you know, obviously a guy with a green face is in your room and it's scary. Calm down. And there's a fucking AK-47 next to him. I'm like, come on, don't do that. And he went for it. I blasted him. Killed him. And... Uh, and then his wife sees it. So I just shot this guy next to his wife. And um, you start to wonder, like, now the only reason I shot that guy is because I am in his house and we were born on two separate parts of the planet. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know him. And then, he's, I mean, the further you get away from it, it's like, um, what if we had met somewhere else, like in, in a coffee shop in France? Would we have shared a joke? Was he yeah. funny? Didn't matter. Damn. Yeah, the, I think I think I found the further you get away from war, the, the more it starts to sink in. Um, that a lot of guys are killing each other because a lot of narcissists that are in charge have you do it. Do you think? I, I often wonder that too. Would would we have got along? Or I know it's crazy. I mean, I, I feel like I would have liked half of those people probably more than more than the people that I'm around. You probably right have now a lot more in common you with know? them. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it is fucking crazy. Yeah, it's, it's insane to think about. Yeah, and, and I mean, because the the um, the humanity of it, people don't realize the the humanity that uh, um, this. I mean, this is uh, people in there's these are dudes in their house with their families. Okay, he's going for a gun. He's got a gun. He's aiming at me. Now, is he protecting his family? And has not is he is he a carpenter? Yeah, he needs an AK because he lives in fucking Ramadi. Uh, and and again, it's be, I think it's just because. Uh, one thing I started, the, the more senior that I got, one thing that I disagreed with was uh, um, patrol to contact and strike to develop. It's like, look, man, you're going to go to a house and, and find someone with a gun and kill them because you went to it. You're in his house. I, I mean, I remember um, one of the things that where I started to not turn, but like say no more um, was I went into the wrong house and I'm on, I, I was in a swamp and I, I, I was walking across this white carpet and these only two people in the in the house were um, a woman and her 10 year old daughter. And I looked down at their white carpet and I remember thinking, I understand why they hate us. Imagine someone doing that here, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it, the shitty thing is you get, you get a lot, uh, the more time you get to think about it, the more you think about it. And you start to realize like it's, it's, it's a, it's a big planet, but it's a small world. And, um, you know, it's just a couple people sending us, I mean, they, they, he believed in his cause. I believed in my cause. That's but. yeah. That's where I was gonna go too. Is it's you? I mean, I don't know what the percentage of people that actually stand up for what they believe in, but I thought it was a lot bigger. A lot bigger until until 2020 came around, and then I realized, man, the majority of these fucking people are just sheep. Sheep. They will just do whatever they're told. Whatever they're fucking told. And they turn it. They turn. They turn it political. Yeah, and more and and and. And we're going up against the the whatever percent. Let's just call it the top one percent that mm -hmm. actually stands up for what they believe in, and it's you're just on the other side of the world, and they just believe something different than what we. That's do. what they, they just, and they believe it, and and uh, they just believe in their cause. I mean, yes, they're the bad guys to us, but we're also the bad guys to them. Yeah. I mean, they attack us because we're the great Satan. Yeah. And they and I you know I tell I uh, I like think about the the crazy aunt you have at. Um, Thanksgiving dinner that is so religious that she knows everything 
they're just like her. <laughs> they just believe something else. Yeah. I mean, the more you know, the more deep you get, it's it's uh, frustrating. Yeah. Because you start to wonder who's calling the shots. But I mean, that's what, that's what we did. And at, like I said, at the time, 27, 30 year old, 32 year old, fucking bring it. I'll fight anybody here. And then then you start to to question. I mean, I mean, I've had guys say, "Do you think you know? Are we?" Are, are we going to get past this? Like, are we going to be good? Like with life? So, and you know, that's, you know, and the P, I think the PTSD comes, it comes with it. And yeah. that's real. Yeah. It's, a, it's unfortunate. And a lot of guys, um, and a lot of men and women went through a lot of shit because some politician told them they had to. You're absolutely yeah. right. That's, I think that's a, why they recruit them young too. You that's know? crazy. But even, even now thinking about Iraq, I can just, I can sometimes sit there and think, so Iraq, <laughs> the fuck was that all about? I think about that too. I think it was all Halliburton. It was Halliburton. You Someone's know. getting paid. Someone's getting paid for the uh, anthrax vaccination, smallpox, all the all the the vehicles that we left there, the shit we brought over, every single round, all the body armor. Someone's getting paid for all. Oh, that's a big contract. Someone. Yeah. Got. Well, I mean, Halliburton did what they were. Oh yeah, they were everything. They were they were the carpenters. They were the chefs. They yeah. were the trash people. They were the fuel people. They were. They were everything. the cleaning crew. They were mm -hmm. ev everything. Every aspect of life and. Iraq that was on an American base was put together by Halliburton, yep. who was tied to Cheney. Yeah, you know. So, but but anyways, moving on. Yeah, moving on. So so where did you go after Iraq? So we did uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Iraq, and then I did the rest was Afghanistan. I'm trying to think of which ones I went to. Where we we sent a small team. So then it reversed. Um, the majority went to Iraq because they got the debriefs on what we were doing. Now the fighting's in Iraq, so they sent a small group of us up to Bagram, and I'm talking a small group, um, eight guys. <laughs> and we were just, um, we had the ability to augment other uh, groups. Um, but, and we, like if we went out on hits, with, which were rare, we, got, we did find some IED guys, we did get some shootout, uh, shootouts there. Um, Wintertime, Afghanistan, so not a lot to do. We um, got to know each other really well. We you know, held training, breaching charges, how to get better at stuff, working out. Uh, a lot of um, MMA stuff, which is a pain in the ass when you when you're sparring with guys that are bored that know how to fight, because yeah. <laughs> they just want to get after it. Um, you know, a couple things here and there. We um, uh, wasn't very exciting, but we kind of did that. I'm trying to think of the other ones. Um, well, let's talk about the Alabama. Okay, so that so that was in 2009, and um, we were sort of aware of. Um, the Maersk, Alabama, getting hit by Somali pirates, but we didn't know what was going to happen. And I was actually so we we're stateside, and we were we were the national mission force for it for something like that that would happen. I happened to be at my daughter's Easter tea party at her preschool on my birthday. It was Good Friday, April tenth, two thousand nine. So it was an Easter tea party, and we were just giving the kids treats. I had a pink plate in my hand. I'm giving her uh, cookies and cupcakes, and um, we got the call. Um, Captain Phillips, uh, the, they gave, they sent us a code that we knew what it was, and basically what they're saying is, okay, he got captured. You're going to get him right now. So your shit had better be ready. You have a certain amount of time to get in there and a certain amount of time to take off. And we had been SEAL Team Six was designed to do this to rescue American hostages at sea. It had never been done, not one time. And no shit. Not, like, this is the first that, one. Twenty eight years it had never been done. And we had been selling that we can take, I don't want to give away the timeline, but we can take off in a certain amount of hours. And we had the commanding officer of SEAL Team 6 on my bird, and we took off at, you know, 59 minutes to, you know, whatever, 59. Like, I could see that, okay, we did it in a certain amount. Now we're, take, now we're flying. And uh, in that amount of time, we, not just me, but we as SEAL Team 6, we had thought of everything, every imaginable at sea rescue, uh, a nuclear problem, a yacht, whatever. We had never thought of uh, a lifeboat, a fully enclosed orange lifeboat being towed by a Navy destroyer. No one thought of that for some reason. So we, okay, we're like, well, we have, um, we have 15 hours to come up with something. So everybody, I don't, the newest goddamn guy on this plane, think of something. Uh, ram it with one of our birds, one of our boats, or a helo. Think of something, and we're gonna list all of them. 
And then we're going to start crossing them off and we'll take the top five. And then from there, we'll get to the best one. And um, we, we did not go over there to kill those pirates. We, we went there to get Richard Phillips. Like we're just gonna, we, we, if we can, we'll just negotiate. I mean, we didn't, you know, they're already negotiating. They didn't, they didn't send an entire squadron to negotiate. We're, plus, we, we know we've been killing people all over the world. So we, but we didn't, we put the snipers down when we got there to um, watch them, make sure nothing unsafe happens as we're preparing for the rescue. And as we were preparing for the rescue, something very unsafe happened, and they shot. That's all. That's how it happened. There was, there was no three, two, one, execute. It was just boom, boom, boom. Someone no shot shit. And so shot. it was all just bam. Yeah, someone shot the red off each other. Like the plan that I thought was going to work, that we came up with was, uh, uh, and I thought this was brilliant. This is why I was actually getting coffee in the chief's mess because we're going to do this plan. Was uh, yeah, I didn't do shit on that fucking thing. Yeah, hold on, you didn't. That was that was off camera. So you were getting coffee. I was. I was. I had just made chief, and I was so happy to be in the chief's mess on a navy ship that I'm in there <laughs> bullshitting with like the bosses made chief, and we're talking about. Uh, who are the Redskins going to draft or some shit? Or were they just... Whatever. <clears throat> and the snipers took the shot. The, the plan that we came up with, meaning me and my team leader, was these are not terrorists. This is brilliant. These are not terrorists. They're criminals. And now they're scared. And they're seasick, which they don't like. And they're out of cot, the drug they take. Yeah. All we got to do is bring them some water and some radios. Get them some radios to the village elders. Let them talk. And tell them we're going to bring them in. They just want to go home now. We get them close, we, you know, the sun comes down, jam the comms, pull them a couple clicks up, and my team will be on the beach. And once they get off, we'll handle it. We either, hey, we're friends, beat it, or we shoot them, and then we take him. So that's, that's the plan that I thought was going to work. So I'm talking football with BMC. <laughs> and uh, we got a message that someone said, yeah, we got him. And I was like, hey, got who? Dude, we got him. We got Captain Phillips. Like, holy shit, Good. you guys are awesome. <laughs> Yeah, they, they got him, and, and um, uh, yeah, they took the shots. Um, I think one of the coolest stories that doesn't get enough credit is, is uh, you know the slide for life, the obstacle we have at Bud's? Yeah. Where you climb up and you slide down a rope, and, like, the Marines have it, Army has it. I remember seeing that thinking, um, what the fuck is the use of this? No one is ever going to need to know how to do this. One guy needed to do it one time, and it was after they shot, that sniper needed to go down and uh, pull... Phillips out. I'll tell you a story. Now, this is not my story. It's just a good story. So I'm assuming it happened this way. The sniper said, um, and he's probably full of shit, but he said um, when he was going in there, he had to go to his pistol and he did carry a pistol, thank God. And he said, but I'm going into the small um, space and this is the only time in my life that I get to rescue someone. So I got to think of something cool to say, right? Do I say we're a SEAL team? Oh blah, my blah, blah. God. And he said he went in there and they'd been using this entire boat as a toilet for like four days and it's in the African heat and now there's three dudes laying in it and their heads are split open and he said that he he's trying to think of some, something cool to say he looks at Richard Phillips and said I'm definitely going to need therapy after this fuck that's what I say <laughs> need therapy <laughs> holy but, shit but I mean the, what was, the thing about that though was um, from Virginia Beach, 15 hours and 46 minutes later, we had a full head count in the Indian Ocean. We rescued Richard Phillips on Easter Sunday. The thing that people don't think about is, I mentioned we hadn't done that in 28 years. So imagine this, those snipers were in their own beds in Virginia Beach four days before that on a long weekend. Um, it's a long weekend. We've never done this. I'm going to skip work and I'll sight in my gun on uh, Tuesday. You know, their guns did not need to be sighted in for the most difficult shots of their lives, but their guns were sighted in for the most difficult shots of their lives because they were prepared. Wow. Crazy. I, those snipers are just complete badasses. How many snipers were there? I want, I mean, we, we jumped in with 103 people. Like, this is the only, everyone. You jumped shit. in with uh, 103 people? I think, yeah, I think we had 98 canopies, five tandems, some shit. Um, yeah, we, I mean, everybody, every swing and dick that was in Virginia Beach was going on this mission. Uh, and is it just because so, everybody wanted to go? Everybody or? wanted to be on the op. This is a real jump. Yeah. <laughs> the first one. Um, I want to say, I mean. There, so you brought 108 people. We had dudes, I swear to God, <laughs> were riding desks that were like, yep, I have a trident. I haven't operated in 12 years, but I'm jumping. I can still remember this stuff. Um, we had dudes that, um, their first, that was their first jump uh, that were tandem in, uh, con guys. 
Oh wow. Yeah. So I mean, there's there's a there's a sniper team there, but I, I there was three. I want to say the shot. Shit, I thought it was a, I thought it was like five or six of you guys. I didn't realize oh, no. you brought everybody in the there fucking was, there kitchen was dudes sink. In, there was dudes in there before us um, from a from a more advanced squadron that I'm not going to get into. They were sort of there, but then they, you know, we we they were already overseas. They 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 brought us in from Virginia Beach. Okay. And uh, but those, I mean, the snipers. That's just I think that's just cool. Yeah. So was it three simultaneous uh, shots? You know what? I don't think so, but that's what the debrief said. All right. <laughs> I, I wasn't there. I, was, I mean, I wasn't there. Yeah. But they, I know they got him. Well, it's cool that you're a part of it. Y- yeah, yeah. It was it's something. actually pretty fucking funny. You're in the Chiefs mess bitching about football. I think it's awesome because if people say, um, you know, you're telling stories that aren't true, it's like, no, I really was in the Chiefs mess. <laughs> like, whatever do you mean? <laughs> Holy shit. So, but yeah, then that was that. And um, so now that's the pinnacle. We've done the hostage rescue. Um, we've been in the gunfights, we've done this, and, and then um, we're going to go, I'm going to go to Afghanistan again. And this time, so I'd, I'd been at an outstation, I'd been on the strike teams, I'd run the outstations. Now I'm the senior enlisted, um, running all of them. I'm the senior enlisted for all the outstations. And my job simply now is to work with the agency, get intel from these different places, try to find cor- um, um, cross-border operations again. Um, and it, so at this point... Osama bin Laden is a ghost, and I'm not. He's not even on my fucking radar. I I was at the point, just being at SEAL Team Six. I was. I remember thinking, I hope I get to meet the guy from Delta that kills bin Laden. That's, I, I, this is as close as I. This is awesome. I hope I meet him. So like one of the big we did a um, we the, the biggest thing we did on this one was we found an Al Qaeda guy, Abu Iklis Al Masri or some shit like that, who was a tier one target in Korangal, and we did a snatch and grab on a on a highway and got him. Um, <clears throat> this other strike team we're, we're doing, we're, we're doing stuff. One one of the newer guys, first deployment with Red Team, actually got six kills at once with a saw, which I thought like that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we're watching this, and, and but it's so this is uh, this is um, uh, January of 2011, and that's all we're doing, and and you know trying to develop shit. But we're, I'm more planning. Uh, training trips for when we get back, making sure the guys on my team are running their trips the right way, where we're going to go. And we, we planned uh, the first um, trip back for my team, my troop actually, was to go to Miami to dive. Because our, our biggest concern is more piracy. The pirates have been a, a, adjusting to what we're doing. They had mother ships. Can we do open water dives on a ship that's not, or a ship that is anchored? How do we find it? What can we do? And we're just, coming up with shit but we're done with deployment and we're also in south beach so i want guys to have fun we're going to train but then we're going to go to happy hour no hang out on the beach have some drinks and we're going to train tomorrow and um we were down there we're staying at the courtyard marriott near south beach and we're outside well before we went on this trip our our boss the the commanding officer red squadron was coming on the trip and we're kind of like well that's a drag because can't have as much fun with the CEO there, but he got pulled. They're like, yeah, he's got to go to DC for something, so we're good. And we didn't know why the CEO and the Master Chief went to DC, but we're down there. And then my boss got a call, uh, my my troop commander, and he said, hey, um, we got to go. Ba- we got to go back to Virginia Beach. So pack your shit up as soon as you can. We're, f- get, we're gonna get the first flights out of here. I'm like, what the hell? All right, what's going on? Like, well, fuck, I don't know. So we f- flew back um, to Virginia Beach, and they brought 28 of us into a room. Now, we've got guys on different trips that got pulled in, senior guys from, like, uh, there was a, a rock climbing trip in Nevada, uh, but they got, the senior guys got got called in, and then other guys came in from Arizona, and then we're here. And other dudes are junior guys at SEAL Team 6 are there, but they're not into this secret room. And they, they said, uh, all right, you guys are here because this is not a drill. Uh, this is real. We found a thing, and this thing is in a house. And this house is in a bowl, and this bowl is in a country. <clears throat> and you guys are going to you're gonna go get this thing, and you're going to bring it back to us and show it to us. And we're like, okay, no sweat. Well, first, we're wondering why us, but okay, well, what's the thing? Well, we can't, can't tell you. Okay, well, uh, how are we getting there? Can't tell you. What country is this? We can't tell you. How are we getting there? Can't tell you. How much air support? None. Like, all right, that's an answer. No air support. That's all we know. And they said also we, we we're not we're only bringing shooters. Only seals are going on this. Um, so we can't bring our kick-ass Air Force CCT the radio guys. We can't bring the PJs who are paramedics, or fucking medics. 
So if you know any medical shit, you bring some medical shit. If you know how to use a radio, you're the radio guy. And uh, keep it light because we only have a certain... So we're like, what the fuck is going on? And so we would walk around. We're trying to get our shit ready. We, we, we knew there would be two, two birds. That's all we knew. We assumed it would be ospreys off of a flat top going into Libya because the Arab Spring had just started. Mm-hmm. And they're, we're going to go get Gaddafi. And they want inter- to interrogate him. So we're going to get him. And bring, we, it's got to be that. But we, we're walking down. We're in the new building where the, all of the cages are together on the bottom. And we're running into guys from other squadrons. And they're like, hey, man, what, we heard something's going on. What's going on? And we're literally like, I have no fucking idea. And they, they got mad at us because they thought we were lying to them. It's like, I, I, and we'd run into them when we'd go out at night. Like, I, I, guys, I don't know what we're doing. But we're getting our shit ready. This went on until Friday. And um, they said, okay, everyone go home. Be with your kids. And you're coming back on Sunday and we're going to drive you somewhere <clears throat> and we're going to read you in on what this is. And we're like, okay, what's, who's going to be there at the read-in? And the tired bosses were like, oh, probably the vice president, the secretary of defense, the secretary of the Navy. And we're like, oh my God. And then they're going down the list. They said something, blah, blah, blah. They said CTC pad, blah, blah, blah. blah. They're going down the list. I'm like, C- CTC pad, that's CIA counterterrorism. Uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan. If we're going to Libya, and I didn't say anything, but you know, we went home, hung out with the kids. We came back on Sunday. <clears throat> they split us up into vans. We we had four guys in my van. I got my buddy driving, my other buddy up front. My troop commander, my boss is right here, and then I'm sitting here. And I explained to them on the drive down, we're going to somewhere in North Carolina, and I explained to them exactly what I just said here. And I said, um, this isn't Gaddafi. They found Bin Laden. And my boss looked at me, and, and there was no cheers. He goes, that's exactly what I was thinking. So we just start talking about this. And uh, my buddy driving the van, I'll never forget the way he looked at me in the mirror. And he said, man, O'Neal, if we kill Osama bin Laden, I will suck your dick. <laughs> and we had a laugh about it. Then, um, you know, fast forwarding, obviously, three weeks to the day, we're looking down at bin Laden in his house. And I said, well... Now's as good a time as any, I guess. He's like, oh, fuck you. And I'm like, your bet. But, <laughs> but we got down there and um, they, uh, they, they put us all into a room and um, the commanding officer of SEAL Team 6. So we, each squadron had a commanding officer, but 6 was like a group. So that commander, that CEO came in. And <clears throat> I'll never forget the way he said, the reason you guys are here is this is as close as we've ever been to Osama bin Laden. And it, I mean, it, it sinks in, but there's, you know, we're professionals and we're like, Okay, are we going right now? We, I mean, we're ready. And they, they, they explained to us, they, they brought in the agency team, which is mostly women, and explained to us, they, they went into such depth of how they found him in his long briefs. We're all almost like, look, it, we believe you. I don't need to know this shit. Just you tell me where he is. I, I'll carry the gun and the sledgehammer. And um, they, you know, they were very cool the way they, they talked to us. And, and then they, had a, they told us that the president had, uh, he had about five options to get them. And they said, you know, obviously, um, carpet bomb the fuck out of it. And I think the Air Force wanted like 22 JDMs to make sure. And it's like, all right, Holy you're, you're going to kill everyone around. Yeah. So that's a, I mean, we'll never know if we got them. They, there was something of a, a they, they called him the pacer. They could see him walking outside. We can hit him with one bomb. But I mean, we know how that works. It, you fuck up that one. You're, you'll, you'll never find him again. They, we actually laughed at this one. They said, we can do a joint op with the Pakistanis. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, tell them about it. Yeah. He's fucking out of there. Um, or you're an option. And then you guys can figure out a way. And so, you know, we're thinking everything jumping in. No, can't do this and whatever. And, and, um, but, and, and even the, the president didn't know about the, I guess the, the chief of staff of the Air Force said, well, there is one more option. And he told him about the, the helicopters that no one knew about. And so then we just started training, and that, that was an option. So we trained there. It wasn't to, uh, it was, you know, to obviously to get to know the, the exterior, but don't tell me about the interior. I'll, I'll figure that out when I get there. Don't, don't tell me there's seven men and 10 women and 16 children. You tell me how many people you think are there, and I'll figure out what they are when I get there type shit. And we're just kind of coming up with contingency plans. Uh, we wanted to prove to them, the powers that be, that we are a good option that we know what we're doing. And even even got to the point where uh, President Obama said, uh, I was never 100% convinced bin Laden was there, but I was convinced you guys could go in and find out and go, come home. 
And so we trained on that and we th- tried to think of contingencies, trying to brainstorm everything. Uh, you know, what if the cars leave? What if we get squirters? Who's doing what coming up to this? And, and then we would go back to the hotel or whatever we're staying at. And somebody at the CIA had made a two scale model of bin Laden's house. I'm talking to the. Club. No shit. And so we're talking about it. Um, just, and we're, you know, we're training 12 hour days and talking about it every night than doing it over helos fat. I mean, we fast rope so much. I, I have severe uh, uh, tendonitis still um, from just grabbing that damn rope. Almost to the point like, can we just simulate we fast rope? I know how to do it. I, I can fall. Yeah. <clears throat> but one night, um, one of the bosses said, all right, what's the worst thing that could happen? And the youngest guy in the room said, the helicopter could crash in the front yard. And we're like, what the fuck? Why would you bring that karma here? Yeah. And he goes, I don't know. Shouldn't we talk about that for 30 seconds? So we did that. And then we went out west to a, a, a certain place. And I, I, we were even to a point where, um, uh, I, like, I'm, I'm known for morale. I want to keep morale high, crack jokes, have fun. But guys were joking uh, around the table one night. And I said, you guys realize this is a one-way mission. You should take this a little bit more seriously. We're, we're not coming back from this one. And then, yeah, they're like, yeah, you're, yeah, shit. And so we get out there though, and they brought us into the the you can, the movie Zero Dark Thirty kind of plays it right, where the the seals walk in, they see those helicopters, and I remember I started laughing, and they're like, what's so what's so funny now? And I said, well, before I thought there was a ninety percent chance we're gonna die, but I didn't know they were sending us uh, in on transformers, <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of and it's like, well, these, I mean. And these things, someone designed it. Um, the pilots that came out, they gave us the four best pilots in the world, Army pilots. They had never flown these things, and they, we trained on those for four days. And then um, then we uh, went one more time home to see our kids, and then we forward staged to Jalalabad. Because if, they, if <clears throat> President Obama gives us the green light, um, we want to be right there. So, And, uh, you know, you still can't. And the reason they picked us is because um, we had a, a team already in Afghanistan, we had the National Mission Force, which is for a contingency. But if, if that team in Afghanistan stopped working and just started training, someone might notice. If the National Mission Force leaves, someone might notice. This squadron is supposed to be leaving. No one's going to care. That was us. So it's better to be lucky than good. So we went over there. There was a, a squadron over there. And we came in to do the bin Laden raid. And they knew it. Oh, can you imagine? And they, I'll tell you what, I cannot say enough good about them. I would have been, fuck you guys. We're SEAL Team 6, and we're, and you guys come to do it? They could not have been more welcome, welcoming to us. You know, I mean, they were pissed, but they, they were complete pros. Wow. And, um, and then we waited there. Uh, we, we would play poker with those guys. And they said we actually weren't fun to play poker with because they're like, fuck it, I'm all in too. I'm going to die tomorrow. <laughs> 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 Just, you know, dark humor. Uh, but then we did we did get the green light, um, and we're going to launch. We have Saturday or Sunday to launch because that's our um, 48 hours of 0% illumination. And if we miss that window, though, we, we got to wait 30 days. I mean, we're going in 0%. And we got lucky because the rumor was that bin Laden was, was going to leave on September 11th of that year to a new place. That's the rumor. It could be false, but that's what I heard. Um, so we got the green light. We didn't launch on Saturday because of the correspondence dinner. And um, we figured if if um, the entire cabinet and the president are in a room with the entire press corps and they all get up and leave, the press corps is going to be like, huh, what's that all about? Yeah. And I guess even Hillary Clinton was like, wait, we're not launching on Saturday because of a deal? Fuck those guys. We're launching. Yeah. Which I, I mean, Hillary Clinton, you know, I'd never vote for her, but I'd take her in a foxhole. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, yeah, we did on, so we did on Sunday. We're going to go Sunday and it's, it's, uh, it's 100% we're going. And we, we went to... Um, we went into a hangar to get the final brief. We're going over everything that we're going to do. And, and we, I mean, we're good. We, we know the exterior. We know who's supposedly there. We talked to the Intel analysts. We, they're with us still in, in, J, in JBAD. And um, uh, Admiral Bill McRaven, he, he, he's given us the last speech. And he said, uh, you know, guys, last night I watched my favorite movie, Hoosiers. And the best part of that movie is when this team from Hickory, Indiana, makes it to the state championship and they walk into this gym and it's an arena and they're starstruck and they're just looking around and coach had um, one of the guys grab 
a tape measure and say, what's the distance from the back of the rim to the free throw line? He said, it's 15 feet, coach. All right, get on his shoulders, gets on his shoulders. What's the distance from the hoop to the floor? And he said, 10 feet, coach. And he goes, I'm sure you'll find these are the exact measurements in your gym in Hickory. This is just a bigger arena. And he goes, you guys do this every night. This is just a bigger arena. And then we were leaving. And I remember we went up to him and said, hey, Admiral, um, you're so fucking busy. I... I doubt you watched Hoosiers last night, but you were born to give us that speech right now. Yeah. And so then we left, we took a team picture and then uh, uh, we had our gear on and uh, like, you know, said uh, said goodbye to the guys that were there. And, and we, we actually, um, is, you know, we're going with uh, the, the shooters to the first two birds. And, it's, you know, instead of, uh, instead of like giving them a fist pound, it's giving the guys hugs. And it's like, I right, see you, on, see you on, the, on the ground. And, and then, you know, we left. You do your last thing, take a piss or what? Like one of my concerns was how how are we going to pee um, on the way? I don't want to get out and have to pee. Like, and they actually someone came up with these little. I don't know if they have them now. They're probably common. Those little diapers you unfold, you can pee in them. But I, I actually like, I don't even trust these things. I'm peeing in a bottle and I'll throw up. I actually kept the damn bottle of piss in my pocket the whole mission. I forgot about it. <laughs> Pretty excited. I mean, th to the point where we were um, we were um, we were given access to everything like didn't even need to be approved for use yet the, if, if it works uh you can have it and we uh but we're now we're measuring like we're cu trying to cut guys off for like you're too heavy these two guys don't carry that because certain pounds of fuel to get there because we don't have refuel it was that calculated we were trying to keep it to, 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 to that 32 minutes on the ground we had a dude come in this i don't remember what the hell he was trying to sell us but he said uh here's this box that uh, it jams everything, like it jams cell, but like it can it can jam landlines, it jams this shit, and it, it weighs and it's like the uh, um, a, a kilometer radius. Wow! And one of the guys goes, "Has it been tested in a helicopter?" And he goes, mm, "No." And he goes, "I have a better idea. Can you invent something that's only thirty pounds?" Uh, it's the radius of this room, and it jams bad ideas. <laughs> That's a good shoot. Anyway, so so we went out there, and uh, we got in the birds, um, and then we took off, and we left. And we had um, we had a, a ninety minute flight into into his house. We now we actually had we had more birds behind us. There was actually uh, blue team guys in forty seven in Chinooks behind us, uh, forty five minutes, and then there was more on the border with Rangers, and then there was more. Oh, wow. Because the word I got, I wasn't there, and this is some South Side Chicago fucking politics, was when they told um, President Obama our plan that, like, yeah, they're going to get here. The first, if they get contact with the PAC mail or the PAC police, we're going to hard point. Uh, we don't want to get in a shootout with them because they're not our enemy, and then you can send someone to negotiate with the Pakistanis and pull them out. And he goes, that's interesting. Hmm. And then he looked at the chief of staff of the Air Force and said, what do you need to rain hell on Pakistan? My guys aren't fucking surrendering to anybody. No shit. And that's what I heard, and that's pretty cool. And that, and that was so. This is a mission now where politics is out the window, and then you got to figure President Obama, he's going to lose re-election if we all die, and and that not that that matters, but does to him. Yeah. But he's making the fucking call because this is what we're going to do. So um so we're so we have birds behind us. Like if we need to get, um if we need a, a QR an IRF and a QRF, we got our guys coming in, and we're fucking we're fighting, and we then I, I know we have shit above us but they didn't really tell us because we got enough on our plate like i'm assuming someone that's invisible has some bombs up there <clears throat> so we're flying in 90 minutes to get into bin laden's house and um um we can get shot down now at any time we don't know if this technology works we don't know if the the most high speed pakistani new guy is manning the radar system pointing that way and he'll shoot us down and we can't even, even be mad at him because we're invading yeah um but worrying about that missile isn't going to stop it. So if you're worrying about something that it doesn't stop worrying, you're wasting your energy. If we die, we die. And so I'm looking around at other guys in this bird. How are they handling it? And dudes are sleeping. And I remember thinking you were asleep on the ride to Bin Laden's house. You have ice in your veins, man. That's just fucking insane. Uh, and I'm I'm sitting next to Cairo, the dog, and then Cheese. The, he wrote the book No Ordinary Dog. Uh, they're back there and uh, Cairo's just, you know, being a good boy. And, and uh, I was counting to keep, I learned in Kosovo as a sniper to count. When you're, when you got, when you're glassing something and you just count. Zero to a thousand, thousand to zero, and then change your cadence, keep your mind working, but keep focused. 
And, um, you know, we're, we're like 90 minutes in or 80 minutes into a 90 minute flight. And we banked to the to the south. And I don't know how I remembered it, but I, I was counting 556, 557. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. You know, and, you know, politics, whatever. That's what George Bush said on 9-11. And I was like, shit, I'm going to keep saying that. And then it's like, wow, we're I'm on this mission. We're on this mission. We're going to fucking kill him. So we, we did another bank and then uh, the air crew guys open the door and now we're looking out it's not even and that's something they don't get credit for the air crew guys they put their asses in those seats too if we get shot down they're dying as well and their job was to keep the bird flying and open the fucking door what if we couldn't figure out how to open the door something that simple he yeah. knew how to do it he opens it up now it's it's a Abbottabad Pakistan is a resort town and there's electricity this is not a training area this is not Afghanistan this is some serious Navy SEAL shit we're about to do so the perfect plan was I was in the second bird. The first bird's gonna go right in between Bin Laden's house and the and the um, guest house. They're gonna fast rope everyone out. We're gonna insert a sniper, um, some snipers, a dog, an interpreter, and a machine gun. Then my team's gonna go to the roof. We're gonna fast rope down onto the roof, and then we're gonna figure out how to get to the balcony. And basically, that's I'm gonna fucking jump, and I'm, I'm gonna shoot it out. There's probably a window there. Bin Laden's in the. The woman told me. Third floor, Bin Laden is in his house. And that's what's going to happen. And then it went to shit because I guess there was an updraft. There was, it, the, the weather was different or something. And the, the pilot realized that if he, um, if a, an inexperienced pilot would have tried to power it up and that would have flipped it or something. He explained that later. And he said, the safest thing now, if I can, if I can pin it to the ground and the, that put the tail on the, on the fence, we could live. So he did that, and he saved everyone's lives just making that decision. Shit. And it was on purpose. Um, and then our, so we took off to go to the roof, but our pilot, now the communications is kind of sketch here. Um, our pilot saw him do that, and he realized that, well, shit, if he can't hover, I'm not trying up there. So he just went back down. So all we know is we went up and we came down, and the pilot's basically saying, get out. And I remember putting my, my first foot came out, and I'm looking at Bin Laden's house, and I remember thinking, fuck it, I guess we'll start the war from here. And I knew damn well there's a um, there's a wall just because we trained so much. There's a door on the wall, northeast corner, which is off to my left. And so the breacher decided to go up and put a, a seven foot charge of C six on it. So we're so now because we're hitting this side, they're somewhere in there. I think we're gonna go into the house this way, and we can just we can go up with them. Uh, he blasted the door. It opened like a tin can, and there's a brick wall behind it. So on the wall, there's a wall, and a, and the breacher said, "All right, failed breach. This is this is bad." He said, "No, this is good." That that's a that's a fake door. Nobody does that. He's he's in there. So then we we know there's another door over here, which is the carport, which we know opens because the cars go in and out. And we didn't know what happened. We we heard them saying dash one going around, but what they were saying was dash one going down. So we just gave him a courtesy. Hey, we're gonna blast the carport, and they said, don't blast it. We'll open it. And the door opened, and the thumb came out with a glove that I recognized. And that now we're at a point in life where it doesn't matter why you're here, you just are. Yeah. I tell football teams that all the time. It doesn't matter why it's second and 15. It just is. Time's kicking. Let's move. So we walk in. Um, it didn't make sense to me why they're in there. I saw the air crew standing there. I saw American flags, but different, um, you, different gear. And I, I remember thinking, who the fuck are these guys? Whatever. And so we're, there's already a gunfight. Stuff's going on. Uh, explosions. We go into the main house. Um, uh, there's guys going down the hallway. This is the first floor of Bin Laden's house, and we're backed into this uh, into this room. And I'm I'm like looking around for bombs. Like I th they're they're gonna blow this house up. If anyone's gonna martyr himself, it's Bin Laden. I don't see any, but I'm seeing guys knowing that they could blow up, but they're not. It's not affecting them. They're doing their jobs and uh, being proud of them. Like this is just you guys are fucking cool. And uh, uh, the guy next to me in the room, he he whispered and he said, "Helicopter crashed." And I said, what helicopter? And I thought some of the birds behind us had crashed. But he said, bro, our helicopter crashed in the front yard. You walked right past it. Holy shit. And it's like, okay, that, that, makes, that's make, that makes sense. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. So I'm watching guys 
do their jobs, even though we are in this is a, an extremely high high threat situation. Um, and dudes are dealing with problems. But what I remember seeing, you know, they just the guy just told me the helicopter crash. I'm like, what helicopter crash? And I thought uh, one of the other helos had been shot down. And he goes, bro, our helicopter crashed in the front yard. Like you walked right past it. And I remember sort of trying to justify my, I'm like, well, I must have been looking this way because that's been Lon's house. But I'm watching dudes run from different rooms to grab kids that have been separated uh, from their families to bring them back to their family so those kids w would not be as afraid as they are right now. And, and I remember thinking, you know, being proud of the guys, but then thinking that is what the good guys do. Yeah. Al Qaeda's not doing that when they come to our house. No. You're going to shoot it out, they're going to cut people's heads off. We do that because we're the good guys. And I'm sure you've seen it in combat. Yeah. But now we're, we're, in, we're on the first floor, and then they, they breach the second, to the second floor. The woman that found bin Laden said, I don't know what it looks like inside, but there will be a stairwell going to the second floor, and you will run into Khalid bin Laden. And he's 20 years old. That's bin Laden's son, and that is his last line of defense. He will be armed on the stairwell. And she was so badass, she said, here's the way she put it, if you can ace him, you get a shot at the big guy. And that's just a, that's a cool brief right there yeah. from a badass, you know. Um, so she was right. And, and it turns out um, she was 100% right on every single person in and out of the house. No Everything. Shit. Nailed it. But we get to the stairwell and it comes up, it comes back. So the stairs go this way, there's a little area and then it comes this way. And Khalid was there and he he jumped behind a banister. And I'm at this point now because I like I had the front row seat to the coolest hit mission in modern history. I'm just watching cool guys, right? And they're going up the stairs and he jumps back and I'm a certain amount of guys back and normally in an urban setting, if we're fighting up, I will pull guys out. I only want a certain amount of guys on there just to avoid uncertain, I mean, unnecessary deaths if he starts dropping shit on us, like grenades and whatnot, or to take a shot down the stairs. But I figure we're going to die anyway, so I want to see how this goes down. And I'm just standing there. I don't have a shot. And now we're back to being quiet. And it's dark. And um, the point man said something like, and I'm going to fuck this up. It was something like Khalid Urfa Aidek, Khalid Delta Rasha. Something like that, but it was basically come here, come here in two different languages that he knew Khalid spoke, which I think is incredible because I would have thought he would have pinned it and tried to get a shot off. And Khalid simply got confused and he leaned over the thing and went, what? No shit. That is the coolest thing I'd ever seen in combat. How tactically savvy are you to think of doing that? Like, well, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. We might be Pakistanis here to move him. He doesn't know. I'll just call him out. And he did. So he, and he was armed, perfectly within his rules of engagement. We step around him. We go up to the, the last, the, the second deck, the last set of stairs. And I, I move from this point from like eight, the eighth guy to the second guy, because everyone else went to the right and to the left, because they're going to, you want to clear, obviously, um, the area before you move on. But now we're down to two, and we're pointing at the last set of stairs. And above it, there was a curtain. It looked kind of like a, um, a shower curtain, but it was like a green olive drab type thing. And we can see there's sort of backlit. There's people moving. Uh, and we assumed those are the suicide bombers. But Bin Laden's in there. And I, the guy in front of me took a shot before we got there. And they're moving around. And I'm the two-man. And my job as the two-man is to, is to hold him and wait. His job is to simply look forward. Don't drop security. And I got you. And through effective communication, when it's your time to go, I will squeeze you. It's on. I'm just telling you through effective communication, we have enough guys. But we don't have enough guys. We're out of guys. It's two of us. And um, I, I'm, I, want, I want four more. I'll take two. But he starts saying, we got to go. Come on, we got to go. He doesn't know it's me. He knows it's one of his guys. And what he's saying is, uh, is um, those are the, basically suggesting those are the suicide bombers. But if we go right now, we can beat them. And I remember taking a deep breath and... Uh, it wasn't. It was no by no means bravery on my part. It was more of a okay. We're, we're going to blow up now, and I'm tired of I'm tired of thinking about it. Let's fucking get it over with. So I get him squeeze, and he he goes up, and he he moves the curtain, and there are um, there are three people standing there. He didn't have even enough time. He just jumped on him. He how he doesn't have a medal of honor is beyond me. He jumped on the grenade so the guy behind him could get the shot. 
Damn. So he and I and simply because he went this way, I turned this way. And standing three feet in front of me is Osama bin Laden, and he's got his hands on a mall, his wife's shoulders, and I don't know what he's doing. He's not surrendering. He's he's maneuvering somehow. His hands are on her, and I remember thinking he's taller than I thought. He's skinnier than I thought. Um, so you knew it was him. Oh, right away. Right the away. Corner? Yep. His, no his, his beard is gray. He's not surrendering. He's, he's got to have a suicide belt. So I shot him twice when he was standing up. I shot him again on the floor. And then I moved Amal out of the way. So I can, he- I can hear Bin Laden taking his last breath. He f- when I shot him, he fell to the foot of the bed. Where'd you shoot him? I shot him in the face three times. Um, I moved Amal. And, uh, and I, his two-year-old son is now standing there. And this is the humanity of everything. This kid has got nothing to do with this. I'm a father. And I picked him up. And I move him. I move him to the back of the bed, and uh, she'd been shot. And and uh, I turn around and um, I, I kind of froze. And I'm okay. We, we other Navy SEALs are now coming in the room. A lot of guys are in there. And one of my guys came up to me and uh, he said, um, "Are you good?" And I said, "No, no. Uh, what are we supposed to do now?" And he said, "Now we find the computers. We we do this every night, hundreds of times." And I said, "Yeah." You're right. I'm back. Holy shit. And he said to me, yeah, you just killed Osama bin Laden. Your life just changed. Get to fucking work. And so we did. Um, we, we, uh, they started, we, you know, we actually took, we do have pictures of bin Laden. It's, it's actually my gloves in there, was putting his head together for the picture, dumping water on him. And like it was, a, I think the pictures haven't been released because it's, it's one of those things where you, you really don't need to know how justice looks when it's served. It just, it just is. So those pics on the internet. Those no, are, they're fake. Those it's, it's, it's split from, from, he split from here to here. Okay. Oh I mean, he got hit three times with a. I'm shooting 77 grain hollow point at three feet. Oh. It's a devastator. Yeah. And um, so they're dressing him up. Guys are doing SSC, and I I went down to the uh, sensitive site exploitation. We're finding intel. I went down to the second floor. I had two other dudes with me, and, and we're going through. Now we found these huge offices with with I'm talking computers, hard drives, uh, like the old school towers. Um, we, I were pulling big kit bags from underneath the bed and we're opening them and I, I thought it was a, a freeze dried steaks and it's like wow these guys are in it for the long haul this is and it's like wait a minute no this is raw opium they're trying to make money off this and so we're finding all that shit and we were we were finding so much stuff from from pictures to hard, to hard drive like we're cracking those open pulling the hard drives cds um uh pa- papers handwritten letters um, and we're just shoving it into these. It was to the point where we wanted, you know, we wanted 32 minutes on the floor. I think we were there for 47. And now it's like, okay, come on. We now it's let's leave, let's get the fuck out of here. Uh, I went back upstairs. I actually carried. I helped two, three other seals carry. We carried Bin Laden down all the stairs. We just came up, and I remember yelling at guys, guys, fuck them. We're leaving. Get out. We're we're figuring this out. Uh, outside, I think the ground force co- commander coordinated a way for. Um, Another bird to to, um, to come in to get us. We're going to put him on the on our bird. The first team's going out on that. They're going to go refuel with another bird on a mountaintop. We went out with the body. We actually sat it down next to uh, the lead sniper from the Captain Phillips raid and said, here's your guy. And he looked down and he goes, you got to be shitting me. I'm like, no, we got him. He goes, let's, let's fucking leave. So they took off with them. We went around um, to the other, you know, I think it's to the east side of the compound. We're, we're calling in a 47, but we don't, like I said, we don't have our CCT guys. So we're calling it in and we're rusty. Yeah. And uh, I remember seeing the, there's a guy on Twitter who was tweeting. He was live tweeting, why would they be doing helicopter operations on a Sunday or some weird shit? And I remember seeing him thinking, if we were in Iraq, I'd blast this dude because he's outside of a target with a phone. But we're in pack. They have no fucking idea that we're here. So then we're calling this bird in and I remember we're saying, hey, so we have to blow up the um, the bird inside. We don't. We're gonna leave it. We're blowing it up. But I asked someone, I was like, what, "What? What was the the time fuse on that thing?" And they're like, "Well, th- I'm like, holy shit, abort! We had a we had to actually call off the the bird coming in to get us because we were gonna blow it out of the sky. So oh, they aborted shit. and turned. Then the fucking thing blew up. I'm like, we almost just blew our own helicopter out of the sky. Then they came back in. We get on that thing and then we take off. And uh, now we're leaving. Now on a mission where we're supposed to die, but now we're leaving. And if we can live for no- another 90 minutes, if we can cross the border to Afghanistan, we get to 
see our kids again. We get to live another 50 years. But they know they got to know we're here, and they could shoot us down, probably with a, an F-16 that we sold them, the Packies. But worrying about that is not going to stop it, so I'm not going to worry. So we're sitting there in this bird. I have the... Um, the the lead sniper from the Captain Phillips raid. There was a weird thing with um, with jealousy um, when when this sniper initiated the fire um, because he, sometimes when people are so close to doing something they get angry and they were giving him a lot of shit talking about firing him. I, I remember saying to him at work uh, after the Phillips raid, "Hey man, don't pay attention to that shit. You're a fucking hero. Don't you ever forget it. Take a Copenhagen from me. Take mine. You're a hero." And I would remind him that he was going through a really rough time. We're sitting on this bird flying out, and I'm trying to absorb what the fuck just happened, and I see this Copenhagen coming in front of my nods, and he said, take one of mine, now you know what it feels like to be a fucking hero, which is just insane. A dude next to me from the other squadron, blue squadron that was there, he's from New York, and he asked a, a question that every SEAL asked when they found out Bin Laden was dead. They, he said, who got him? And I said, I think I did. And he said, on behalf of my family, thank you. So now it's, it's deep, but, and we gotta, you know, can't worry about the shit, we're, so we just start our watches, and so we're counting. We gotta live the 90 minutes, but it's been 10 minutes. Now it's been 20 minutes. Now it's been 30 minutes. And now it's 40 minutes, 50 minutes. We gotta get to 90 minutes, but it's been 60 minutes. Then I start thinking about, like, uh, all the weird sports analogies, like watching a, a no-hitter at the top of this seventh at Fenway Park. Like, I'm not gonna say anything, I don't want to jinx it, you know, but it's been 70, now it's been 80 minutes. Then I start thinking about um, one of the greatest games ever played when the Team USA hockey team beat the Russians in Lake Placid, a team they're not supposed to beat, but now they're winning four to three. And you can hear the crowd counting down 10, nine, eight, seven, six. We got to 85 minutes into the flight and the pilot came over the radio and just as cool as ever said, all right, gentlemen, for the first time in your lives, you're going to be happy to hear this. Welcome to Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, and that now it's like, holy shit, we did it. We land, the, now the other bird had to go to a mountaintop and refuel. They're in the other stealth bird with another 47. They're still coming back and so it's like, okay, come on, guys. They land. And like, no one's hurt. And then Bin Laden's over here. The the guy that was in front of me to go up the stairs into, into Bin Laden's room, we're like, hey, man, we, you and I need to talk. And we go over into the corner, and, and he's like, what the fuck happened on that stairwell? I'm like, it was just down to us. I don't know. I mean, that, and then he looks over to the, the woman that found Bin Laden and said, uh, well, there she is. You got to go give her something, man. You own this. I was like, yeah, you're right. And uh, I walked over to her and I, I pulled the magazine out of my gun. I jacked the last round out and I said, do you have room for this in your backpack? And she said, I think I do. And then I said, well, we have something to show you. Now, in the movie Zero Dark Thirty, they brought the woman over to Bin Laden's body and it was like a moment of pause and they opened it. She looked and she was all thoughtful and she cried and left. That's not at all what happened. Here's what happened. I gave her the mag and we said, we have something to show you. Now, it starts to, again, Moments were sinking in, but it's like, you know what? This is historic. Like this, this yeah. will be in the history books. You know, she found him though. She's the reason this happened. She gave up her life for this. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have kids, and she's been working on this twenty hours a day for years. And then, and then I'm like, uh, you know, this is this is like, this could go down with Iwo Jima. Um, but then, as being the arrogant Navy SEAL, I'm like. Put the pressure on myself. Shit, I gotta think of something cool to say. Ugh. So we're walking over to the body, and I thought this would have been good enough. I looked down and I said, "Is that your guy?" And she looked down for a second, and went, huh, "I guess I'm out of a fucking job." <laughs> <laughs> and left. You gotta be shit. Left me. at that. Yeah. So then we um, we uh, Mc McCraven was there. He actually, uh, he, they're, they're, now they're, we're in the process of, we do have some DNA tests. We got a lot of pictures. He was talking to, um, to the White House, and he, he had one of our snipers lay down next to him because our sniper was 6'2". Our tallest guy was 6'2". And uh, he said, yeah, I just, uh, I just had one of our tallest guys lay down, and he's shorter than, I think it's him. And the president says, let me get this straight. You can blow up one of our $200 million helicopters, but you can't afford a 99-cent tape measure. <laughs> 
so they're doing that. We fly him up to, uh, to and McCra- I remember McCraven just, I, I, um, we're standing there. He came up to me and he kind of just put, he didn't say anything, but just put his hand on my shoulder like this. And it was like a, just a uh, fuck yeah moment. Went up to Bagram. I mean, everyone, we're still looking around at each other. Now we got everything laid out. The, the smart guy, Bin Laden's body is laying there. Um, uh, we're laying out all the stuff in order of which room, which floor, which building. And they're going through it. There's a dude uh, doing DNA tests. And, and um, we're just kind of standing around. The army brought in these, these, those big green tubs full of breakfast sandwiches. And we have the news on. There's a big TV on. And you can hear it kind of, um, you, you can hear it building up. Like, they know what's happening. There's Geraldo's out there with uh, people in front of the White House. And, and, and our guys are on the phone with with the White House, and they're just trying to. Uh, the president wants a, a full count: how many were wounded, how many are killed, what's the total. And we're just standing there. there Bin Laden's right here, and uh, I remember everything quieted down. The president is on TV with a red tie, walking down a uh, red carpet. Came up very presidential to the podium and said, "Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world: the United States conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al Qaeda." I hear the president of the United States say Osama bin Laden. I look at Osama bin Laden and I thought, how in the world did I get here from Butte, Montana? Damn, dude. And that and that's it. And then we um, <laughs> and then here's where it gets cool. I mean, I mean, just camaraderie thing is like, well, you know, well, we should shower up because we're flying home, and I could use a drink. Where are the fucking sea beasts? <laughs> you're gonna find everything. You need. You're gonna find showers. You're gonna find pizza. You're gonna find beer and probably some whiskey. So we went over there, and uh, and it was, you know, like, that's when it started to get a little awkward because we we they do have the internet over there. We're getting and everything. Black, Seal Team Six, Seal Team Six, Bin Laden, you know. It's, and then that's it. It uh, this is gonna be bad, but for now it's gonna be good. And yeah. uh, actually, the the ground force command when we went back, uh, the ground force commander who who is probably the smartest guy I've ever met. Um, photographic memory. He could operate on an hour sleep a night and be fine. Uh, and he's by the book, but he pulled the point man and me into a room and he poured us a shot and we all took a shot together. And he's like, great job, boys. We hop on a plane, we leave. Um, pop an Ambien, which, you know, was awesome. And we slept to Virginia Beach. We landed there and then uh, it was almost like a scene where there were people waiting for us. Other SEALs were there with a couple buses, coolers full of beer and uh, cheers and high fives. And then we went to the command and... Uh, and that was that was it. And I was like, man, we're, we're going to be the best friends um, in the world forever. Man, that's fucking. That's insane. Wow. I need to tell a part that I didn't. You can edit in, if you don't mind. I'm just going to edit. Okay. Um, so we're having this conversation when I asked what helicopter crashed, and he said, "Dude, our helicopter crashed in the front yard." Because I thought it was something else. As we're having this conversation, one of our snipers was running around the compound with Cairo and his job was to circle it twice to make sure no one squirted it um, you know, ran out of the, the building and he when we're having this conversation inside he ran into the point where the pilot had the the tail on the fence so he's looking up and sees this tail he didn't know they crashed either and he came over the radio and said guys inside be on alert they are ready for us they have a training mock-up of our super secret helicopter in the front yard <laughs> And there was a weird silence, and the boss came over the radio and goes, no jackass, that's ours, because we crashed. <laughs> and he said, he, he, and he said over the radio, yeah, that makes a lot more sense than the shit I was just saying, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, yeah, I couldn't that up. Damn. Yeah, we got to Virginia Beach, though, and then, uh, and then it just you know turned into, uh, as opposed to being in the shadows, everybody wants to come down and meet us. We, they want to fly us places to meet us. The Secretary of Defense came down, and it was just it, it started to suck because there were dudes that had been at Red Squadron for 16 years that moved on to, like, to operations, and then they wouldn't let them in the debrief with the Secretary of Defense. And it's just like this is gonna there's some bad blood's gonna start, yeah, because of this shit. And uh, you know, and a lot of guys were a lot of guys do want to be the 30 year Navy SEAL. Who retires and then lives in Coronado, undercover forever, and uh, they kind of got that violated. Damn. Uh, one, I mean, one of the one of the funny stories though is is uh, like I was mentioning earlier when when peop- the first question people asked was who got him, and uh, they would say Nizro got him, and I guess the most common answer was, oh fuck, we're never gonna hear the end of this. <laughs> Damn dude, yeah. that's um. 
Man. That's an awesome. Oh, crazy. Fucking. I don't even know what to say. Yeah, I mean, it's but it's it's like it's like it was written that way or scripted. It's just uh, the way it worked. Great team. The pilots that got us in and out. I mean, that takes balls to fly a Chinook that far into Pakistan to pick up guys that are already in gunfights with Al Qaeda. And I think we killed um like three of the top four that night. No or shit. If, if we hadn't, we we did within the next few days. And there was like eleven other ops that JSOC did that night in Afghanistan. Like it was a fucking. I mean, it was it was part of, being part of something great, and, and I couldn't be more proud. That's insane. Yeah. That's insane. Let's take a quick break. Yeah. That was heavy. All right, so we just covered the whole raid, yep. everything that happened. There's a lot of conspiracies oh, out yeah. there, <laughs> a whole lot of conspiracies out there on whether it, whether it was a double. Yep. But why why did they dump the body into the ocean? We they had told us that's what's going to happen even before we left, <clears throat> and I remember we were asking why is that you're going to dump him in in the ocean, and they said well because we don't want a shrine to him where people can worship. And I remember explaining to them, you don't understand Sunni Islam. Um, you don't, uh, there's one God, you worship Allah, you not false prophets. They would not do that to Bin Laden. You don't worship him because they don't believe in that shit. Um, you can do something else with him, but they, they were convinced they wanted to do that. Um, there are pictures of him that I've heard are in cabinets in, at Langley. I don't know, but uh, yeah, all, all I know is we, we handed him over to some senior guys from the army and they flew him to the USS Vincennes. I believe I said that right. I could be wrong, but it's that ship. And that they have the coordinates of where they dropped him. And I didn't see it. Um, I believe it. I mean, I know he's dead. I know we have pictures. I wish they would release him, but I didn't see it. So, you know, as far as I know, he could be freeze-dried somewhere, too. Huh. I mean, I don't know. I, so I, they, t they told you that before you even went on the raid? They're yeah. like, hey, we're going to dump him in the ocean. Yes. Why would they even I don't know. I mean, tell you that? I, I had a, a lot of different options. For him, but that was it. They, they, that was that's going to happen. Just bring him out. And I mean, they, they, they labeled it. They did the test. They have the test. But they, they, someone took the body away, and then we never saw it again. Interesting. Yeah, it is. Have they ever done that with anybody no. else? I don't, I'm not as far as I know, but yeah, I've never heard anything. Yeah, they were they were saying they brought him to that ship. They gave him a proper burial, and then they threw him over, and no one was allowed to watch. I guess. A proper burial, huh? Well, a proper burial at sea. <laughs> as, far as, as far as getting thrown over the side of a ship, I guess it's proper. <laughs> Kick him off a fucking fantail. That's about it. Damn. But yeah, they wrote down the coordinates, and they, they apparently marked the uh, the pad eye on the ship. Which means whatever, but yeah. And there are guys that said they were on the ship that they know what happened, but I don't... I mean, I've never seen footage of it, so it's... I mean, I can understand, too, the conspiracies around it. Like, why, you know... I mean, it's definitely <laughs> odd. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. You know? I mean, because like, like I said, there's not going to be worshipers for him. And and even now, with that, it kind of is the mystique of did they really get him type shit. Yeah. No. So when did you when did you decide you were going to come out and say that you're the, you were the shooter? I didn't, uh, I didn't do it at first, but um, my name did go around really quickly. In Virginia Beach and Coronado and in DC and New York because people just know people around there and I was getting calls uh, that no uh, the next night from people saying hey man tell us what happened all this you know shit like that um you know and, and there was a uh, people kind of knew and and and, and um, they would single me out in in different briefs and I really didn't care for that because I've always said it's a team effort I, I, I didn't it's not me guys it's, it's the look at the pilots thank them because they're the smart guys thank the intel officers that found him uh, and then it, it just started to get uh, it, it started to get awkward, and I decided, you know, it's um, I'm gonna tr I might move on. And then uh, we but we went from the the best time in our career to the worst time because soon after, on extortion one uh, August sixth, extortion one seven was shot down. We lost thirty one Americans, and we went from planning missions to planning funerals. And it's like you know what, I, it's time to leave. I need to um, I, I want to see my kids get married, but because we lost so many guys at Gold. We need to backfill, so I'm going to do one more deployment. So I actually left Red Squadron and went to Silver Squadron to go immediately to Afghanistan. 
because my entire point was, uh, I'm, uh, I, I came in through the front door and I'm going to leave through the front door. I'm going to do one more deployment to prove to you guys, you know, I'm not in this for the fame. I'm not trying, I'm not writing a book. There yeah. was rumors that I'm writing a book. Like someone actually pulled me aside and said, uh, one, of the, one of my officers and said, I heard you just got a $17 million advance to write a book. And I said, well, I don't think you know how books work because you don't get a $17 million advance unless you're a president. Uh, but yeah, but that, there was just, you know, rumors flying around and all this shit. I, I did go to Afghanistan and, and uh, you know, I extended. And I got out in uh, August of, of 2012. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I started work. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the hell I was qualified for. No degree. I started working in, in Washington, D.C., um, on Capitol Hill with different people. And I met, I met a congresswoman, Carolyn Maloney from New York. And, and she said, you know, you should, you should probably um, donate something to the 9-11 Memorial. Um, and I did because it's in, it's, if you haven't been to the memorial, you, you got to go. It's, in, it's insane. It's in chronological order of what happened on 9-11. And at the end, I anonymously donated my shirt uh, with an American flag just so people could see this shirt was in the room with bin Laden. The CIA analyst donated a coin that she had and it's kind of there. But when I donated it, I went into a room where there were 30 some people. I didn't realize I was going to be speaking right then. They had all lost someone in the towers. And, oh, shit. Uh, and I'm up on stage and I, I, this is the first time in public I told the story and to see their responses to um, crying in their hands, um, you know, wanting to give me a hug. And they were saying that uh, there's never going to be closure, but this helps with the healing. We can put a face with what happened. Because like we just said, we buried him at sea. You don't really know, but I'm telling you what happened because I was there. And I said, uh, I actually had a film crew there to document... Um, me donating it for his historical reasons, but I was like, if I, if I can if I can help thirty people with the healing, I can help thousands. If I tell the story, and then uh, it was a tough decision, but I, I I got my story approved, the only one approved through the Pentagon, and uh, and I and I came out with the story. Just you know, I've assumed risk before, and I'll, I'll do it again. It's it's worth it. Yeah. What, so you went to Silver after that? Did you, I did. What were you guys doing over there? Um, another another winter deployment to Afghanistan. Okay. I actually, um, uh, Bin Laden wasn't the last guy I killed with that gun. No he shit. Just kept it with me. Yeah. Well, actually, we we did a we did a, my I think my last mission was my very first L ambush, <laughs> which I think is cool. Cause, yeah. Uh, well, when we were trying to sell it, because you're selling it to staff officers, basically that have, I don't know how they don't know. We were, we we saw this this truck would leave this place, go around a mountain, and drive through the snow and wait to ambush. Americans and they did it like on Tuesday and, we, and the intel saw them and then they did it on Wednesday and then they did it again on Thursday but they're not finding anybody and uh, my troop chief and I were like hey if they do this on Friday the day of prayer they're definitely doing it on a Saturday so we came up with a plan like well we'll just insert where they drive get behind these rocks put snipers up and we're selling it to them and then and we sold it to this army officer like well, then we're going to set, set up an L ambush and the officer said What's an L ambush? And um, I said, sir, an L ambush is the second thing they teach you in the army right after that's your rack. <laughs> this is an L ambush. <laughs> and he goes, well, who invented it? And I said, I think Sun Tzu invented the art of war. Um, and he goes, well, which I said, well, we're going to set up an L. I'm going to form a line of death. I'll be in the middle here. And when he's coming at me, I'm going to stop him. And he goes, what if he doesn't stop? I said, I'm gonna shoot him. <laughs> like, this is what planet are you on? Wow. Yeah. So so we did. We set it up, and, and naturally, like the, the ISRs watched them. They can't get their car started, and, and you know, because it's that Murphy's law. And so we, we're literally smoking cigars. The sun's up, and we're waiting for this dude to drive around. Uh, no one's gonna be there, and you know, and we kept it simple. Like ISR is gonna tell us um, green light, yellow light, red light. And that's when you jump out and you stop them, and it's in the wide open area. And uh, sh sure enough, they're coming. They finally got the car started. You know. Green light, yellow light, red light. We hop out. And then I'm looking at this guy, and he's driving this uh, a car, not even a truck. And I think this is the first words he ever spoke in English where he put it in reverse and just goes, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> and the, the, the car's peeling out. And I'm looking at this dude, and there's uh, you know two dudes in front, three dudes in the back. And I'm like, hey, man, get out of the car. Get out of the car. You need to get out of the car because we got snipers. And uh, one dude hopped out to go to the trunk. This guy's head blasted off, and then... It turned into just a shootout. We killed all of them, and, and uh, it's like, well, that's an L ambush. That was my last mission as an wow. Navy SEAL. And then I, you know, I got out and then um, 
you know, transition out and learn. You got to learn that uh, there's a lot of life after the military. You, you know, military is unique because you, you can get in an 18 and retire at 38. And 38, you got a lot of life, I hope, left in you. Yeah. And then that that's when the, the real work starts. W- what do we do now? Well, what was it like, you know, getting out? I mean, you killed the most wanted man in the fucking history of the world. Everybody I- wants to meet you. Everybody wants something from you. Everybody wants to hear the story. I mean, it, you, there couldn't have been any time for just you and no. There's, there's, and, there's not now too. And and you know, I'll get shit on the internet. They're like, "Why? Uh, hi, I'm Rob O'Neill. I haven't talked about Bin Laden for five minutes." It's like, yeah, but you know, stop asking, and I'll, I'll stop. Yeah, saying it. You got to figure every person I ever meet wants to hear that story. They want to know what happened, and that's fine. That's great. I mean, if. if if I helped this country and our cause, whatever that was, um, then I, I mean, obviously what that was, um, I'll, I'll do it. And it, 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 it's always in person. It's, it's a good thing. I mean, the only issue I have in person is we'll be at a, an airport bar and someone will recognize me and want to do a shot. I'm like, yeah, cool. And it's, but someone else will see me and they want a shot. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's like, okay, you 10 guys had a shot. I had 10 shots. This is bad. <laughs> Damn, dude. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's it, it was uncharted territory because, you know, even I was talking to different agents about speaking, and um, he he said I'm trying to figure out if, you know, trying to price the guy that killed Hitler, and I'm like, well, Hitler killed himself, and he goes exactly, and so it's just you know it's, it, everything's been new, and I, I didn't know at first what's what's going to happen. I don't know now what's going to happen, um, but you know I mean it's been it's people have been been good. Yeah, I mean it. It created a lot of animosity, you know, obviously throughout the community. And, uh, you know, we kind of talked a little about that a little bit off camera, but how, how are you? Cause there is a, there's a lot of hate in this community. Oh, there's a lot of hate. And you know? no, it's, it, it's tough at first because, um, you want, you want to be liked and, and your reputation means everything. But then you got to realize that, you know, what someone thinks about you is none of your business. Stop wasting the negative energy on what they're thinking of you. And if they're pissed, there's nothing I can do about it. If they ever want to work with me, I'll work with them. That's fine. If you want help, ask. I'll help. Um, but if, if you're if you're just hating, then you know take it somewhere else. You, I mean, there, there's a point where you just got to stop caring. I don't care. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, I, and and it, it's like, there's even been points where they're like, well, you know, you know, we heard you didn't kill Bin Laden, and I'm like, some days I wish I didn't. I'm just telling you what happened. Yeah. How long did it take you to get to that point? Oh. Uh, a couple of years. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, because all you know, all you know in the SEAL teams is the SEAL teams, and you're in that bubble. I mean, even when you you know um, you know other SEALs and you know the bartenders, and everyone around you is doing the same shit. I mean, as far as work, and and you know, I found myself in a spot where I'm just in a spot where anyone could have done it. I just happened to turn the corner, and it's just. Um, I mean, it sucks. I, you know, you want to be like, but there comes a point where what you worry about is, isn't going to stop it. So yeah, get get on with it. Well, I think a lot, the reason I'm asking is I think a lot of guys need to hear that because, you know, I don't, I don't fucking care. I'll just say whatever's Thanks. on my mind. I, no, I, that's you know, probably the nicest thing I've ever told. It's it's <laughs> it's in this community. You know, it seems like we like I said we talked about this earlier, but I want other guys that are coming out to hear this shit. Is you know. In this community, everybody likes each other until you're until. doing better than they are. Yep. And then you're the fucking hate target. Yeah, you're the target. And, and you know, there's, I mean, it's 2022 now. Guys are getting out with full careers, you know, first time ever where yeah. guys have been in combat their entire career. They're going to get out. They're going to write books. They're going to start companies. And they're going to get a lot of hate from the guys that are in. And, and um, It seems like as soon as you come out public with anything, it's like... Um, Use your resume. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And the, my, my, I remember my one of my first days at Red Squadron, the CEO of Red Squadron said, you know, when we got out, we could all be millionaires. We could take over the world, but we're never going to. Because he recognized it as well, just, um, just the, uh, the animosity. For some reason, like everyone's successful, but then they hate success. Yeah. So I, You know, I don't get it. I mean, it, it bothered me for a while, but I'm not losing sleep over it now. Well, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> but, but um, well, yeah, let's talk about what you're doing now. Yeah, so I transitioned out of the um, the military, and what I realized is that I didn't know what to do. I had no idea, am I going to sell sunglasses or t-shirts, am I going to do whatever? But I learned that a lot of people want the traits that we have as Navy SEALs, as special operators, um, effective communication, problem solving, the ability to have the difficult decisions with people, to run a team, 
to uh, promote who needs to be in fire, who needs to be. So uh, I started a foundation. It was for, at first called Your Grateful Nation, but now it's called Special Operators Transition Foundation. And it's helped special operators find out where they want to live, what industry they want to be in. Because I've had employers now with some of the products coming out of universities, they don't want that shit. They said, give me one of these guys, men or women, uh, and I'll teach them how to do this job. I want that attitude in the boardroom. Uh, so I've done that transition um, foundation, and then I just I got myself into public speaking. I've been on TV analyzing different stuff. I've, I worked for Fox News for quite a while. Um, I started an apparel company, RJO Apparel, stuff like uh, Front Toward Enemy, which to me kind of summarizes everything. Front towards your problem. Yeah. And on the guess what's in the back? The back. Like even the hoodies we have, it says front toward enemy and the back says back. It is a, it's not a hoodie. It's, it's an instruction manual on how to wear a hoodie. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we did that. Um, uh, I'm involved with a beer company now called Armed Forces Brewing Company, which is veteran owned. Me and a couple of SEALs, McTeams and, and Ray Cash Care. Um, we, we uh, have different beer for different branches. Army, we, we actually, for the Army Navy game, we had beat Army and beat Navy cans. We sold out at the Army Navy game. Uh, we're getting distribution in 50 states uh, just because it's a, it's, it's cool and it's a beer and it's for veterans. Not just for veterans, but for Americans. Veteran owned for American and Americans, Americans like beer and they like veterans. So uh, anything like that, just uh, entrepreneurial stuff. Um, like I said, if, you know, the, the more special operators, more Navy SEALs I can work with, the better because we're going to do better. Yeah. And it's just, um, it is what you make it. I mean, you can sit at home and feel sorry for yourself or you can go do it. Yeah, that's, that's. That's for damn sure. So what about the new book, The Way Forward? The Way Forward I wrote with Dakota Meyer, who is a Medal of Honor recipient, uh, Marine, uh, Ganjagal Valley, one of the worst fights I've ever heard. His, his story is incredible. I'm not even going to tell it. Read the book. It's amazing. He, he, similar to, to me shooting that guy in the room, he got in a fight where he's, he's rescuing, uh, his entire team died. And he's pulling them out. And he got hit in the back, a butt stroke from a Taliban guy. And he actually got into a fist fight to the death with a dude um, to, to the point where he was getting choked out. And I don't know if he faked being choked out, but he ended up turning around. He shot him with a 40 mic. Mike did, was, so, you know, he didn't, it didn't arm, but it hit him. And then uh, he ended up killing this guy with a rock. Oh shit. And it's the point. And, and again, I don't want to tell his story, but it's like, he says there's a point in a man's life where you're looking him in the eyes and you both know it's coming. And then the, the book's called the way forward because it's now what? You know, we did all this fight and we did all this killing. Uh, you start to question why we're killing these people and what's the way forward. Everything from anxiety to abusing the bottle to suicides. What do we do next? And I think, you know, everyone everyone has, what, what do we do now? We talked about the CEOs that have their first day, uh, what next? And uh, that's what it's about. Dakota's awesome. Uh, but but again, with the animosity, like he, he's got stories where he's got, I mean, I thought the Marines were the tightest group. That's and, what I think. And he, Are they he, not? He, no. He, he's gotten the Medal of Honor physically ripped off of his neck at a Marine Corps ball. You got to be shitting no. me. And so it kind of addresses the, hey, what the fuck, guys? So, I mean, it's a great book. The stories are um, incredible because I talk about everything from, it's the transition from the military to the, the adventures that I get into. Um, the story about my wedding that Kid Rock is in how we lost the wedding rings and I had to get my buddy Shorty to find them and how he, I had brand new security at, I'm at a church in, in, um, in uh, Massachusetts at Cape Cod and I hired local cops to be security because I have some celebrities there. Like I said, Kid Rock was there and I'm, I don't know who's going to show up because it's a public wedding. This guy found the rings and what I told these cops was what you got to look for is their hands. If, and especially if a vehicle screams up, my buddy was screaming up to the thing after he found the rings, hops out, reaches for the rings out of his pocket. He's getting drawn down on <laughs> by these cops and you know, sprints in, hands me the rings. And, and then it, it goes on to other Kentucky Derby stuff. But the one story I have in the way forward is, uh, I'm not going to ruin it at all, but it's a hunting story with me, some guys I grew up with, my father, my nephew, my brother, and some Boston police officers. And I have been called out more on that story being bullshit than the Bin Laden raid. No shit. Oh, look, the story's hilarious. But you don't... Let's, hmm? let's hear it. Well, um, the way it started... I don't want to ruin the book, but um, I brought my brother with me. My brother's a DJ, a morning show DJ. He's not a hunter at all. Never been a hunter. But I brought him out to the Powder River in uh, eastern Montana, which has some of the best hunting in the world. 
and we're gonna split up. Um, I sent my brother Tom with my buddy Smooth, and they're gonna go this way. What I didn't realize at the time is Smooth is a former army guy, and he loves to hunt. Like he's he's hiking. Tommy's not. He doesn't like to do that shit. So he's humping up this hill. Um, we're on the other side. I got some of the Boston police guys there, and another truck went up there looking for elk. And uh, I guess my brother was lagging a little bit far back. My buddy Smooth said, you know, you stay here. I'll keep you in an eye shot. I'm going to keep walking up. And all of a sudden, my brother Tommy started roasting a bull. Uh, and he comes back. My buddy Smooth comes back. He goes, what the fuck are you doing? And he goes, what, do you want some? He goes, what about the deer? And he goes, fuck the deer. I didn't bring enough for the deer. <laughs> so <laughs> so they're, they're doing this. I'm on one end, and we're trying to set up another ambush. We have radios, which is totally illegal. Um, now, my, my buddy um, Swift and Ed are in a truck driving up. On the way out here, they, they had stopped at a gas station and Ed decided to buy um, a Reuben at a gas station that had probably been under the heat lamp for a solid three days. Not a good idea. So we got these radios. He immediately got some really bad diarrhea. And I hear over the radio, oh my God, Ed just shot himself. And I said, what, he, he shot himself? And he goes, no, Ed just shit himself. <laughs> so, and I'm like, well, how bad is it? And he goes, pretty bad, he filled his socks. <laughs> oh my so, God. They're driving down. My buddy shit his pants. My brother's getting high. I'm up here. I'm like, look, we're going to call this a day. Get out of the mountains. So we go back to the cabin, break out the whiskey. And I said the next day, um, we're going to hunt the whitetails because we were in the mountains looking for mule deer and elk. Now we're just going to go to the whitetails. They're down by the river that's, you know, a couple hundred meters this way. Me and Smooth are going to walk through here. We're going to push these whitetails out. They're going to see the bend in the river. Some will cross, but some will come to you. So I send my, my father down to one end with my nephew. And I said to my dad, dad, here's the deal. All you got to do is nothing. Just sit here. Nothing. So we go out there. We put the cops out here. We're pushing them. We're, now we're doing a sort of an ambush again. The deer come out. They run to the cops. They, they blast a few. Um, we get in here. A buck comes past me. I shoot him. And then uh, my buddy uh, Smooth, who just couldn't get a break on this trip, I, I see this monster whitetail buck, and I can see Smooth pointing at it, and he just kind of puts the gun down and yells, God damn it! And I said, what? Why didn't you shoot? And he goes, the only two things I saw in the scope was that huge buck and your fucking dad. <laughs> so like, oh, shit. My dad got up and was just walking through there like a geriatric or whatever. <laughs> and uh, he felt so bad, he, my dad just goes, Next time, just shoot. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, all right, cool, whatever. Um, no, before we did this, sorry, uh, Tommy was worn out, my brother Tom, from the hump bef the day before. So when I was knocking on the door, I was like, come on, we're hunting. He's like, no, we aren't doing anything. I'm sleeping. So I go to my um, to the deer that I killed. We're gutting them, me and Smooth. And then Swift comes out on a four-wheeler, obviously with Coors Lights because it is 7 in the morning. <laughs> and uh, he said, hey, congratulations. Oh, Tommy got his buck, too. And I said, no, that's, no, that's not possible. Tommy's asleep. And he goes, no, Tom shot a buck. And it, what turned out it happened is uh, Swift was on the, as we started this ambush, Swift saw these bucks running towards the thing. And he'd already filled his tag. And so he, uh, he's knocking on Tommy's door. He's like, Tommy, get, get out here. And so Tommy came out and probably a joint in his hand. And uh, he said, well, shit. And someone handed him a gun and, and he shot this buck that was coming, whatever. And we go, Tommy, how'd you shoot that buck? And he goes, he was coming right for us. <laughs> He goes, I was in my best porch camouflage. <laughs> Holy and shit. And he goes, so what do I do now? And they go, now you put on orange and we go get the damn thing. Damn, dude. So yeah, but people have said there's no way that happened. But that's that's one of the stories. Well, I'll link uh, I'll link all the everything below, cool. you know, for people to go buy it. And um, hey, man, I don't, you know, we've been going for quite a while, so might as well end it. But Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming and, and sharing that for all those first-hand accounts. And, and My pleasure. Best of luck to you. Appreciate it.